is interesting because we have people who have been you know, part of the work for over a year and then there's people who don't know anything about it. So I don't want to scare the people to death that I don't know anything about it. Um, hmm. Tonight is going to have to be a lot of information consolidated into a short period of time because it's like when we come up we usually do the three days. Okay. How's that? Can you hear me in the back? Is it okay back there? Okay. Seems okay? Okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, tonight there's a bit of ground that I want to cover that has to do with aliveness. That's one thing we all have in common. And we all have different ways of looking at it, and some of us are so used to it that we don't look at it at all. We just take it for granted and don't think about how it gets there. So tonight we're going to talk a bit about aliveness. This is the beginning, really, is an introduction to other information that's going to be covered on the weekend. This is a, a three-day workshop for those who want to come for the three days. There are two full days, tomorrow and uh, Sunday. The information that's going to be released progressively, particularly in the full-day workshops, there's a lot of detail to it, and uh, it's some of the most extraordinary information that I've been privileged to, to understand. There are levels of spirituality that are very difficult to find information about in our culture. And the information that's going to be covered in the workshops tomorrow and on Sunday is going to delve into the heart of those secrets. These are some of the secrets that have been guarded by Tibetan monks for thousands of years, have been guarded by certain groups in India for thousands of years, and there were, it was information that was only allowed for certain groups of people. It was not given to the mainstream populations. And this was not fair, because the information was meant for all of us. So tonight, we're going to get into, kind of move into spirituality and greater spirituality through the simple common ground of our aliveness. And what it means to be alive, where does that aliveness come from? And this is not one of those lectures, God made us, so our aliveness comes from God. Oh, yes, God did make us, but we're not going to go in that direction alone. We're going to explore what it means. What is our consciousness? Where did it come from? How does it get into our body? What is the relationship between our body and our consciousness? Because when you begin to ask these questions, you start to find the area where answers lie, answers that give you a power, a power to begin embracing your spirituality in ways that haven't been available here for thousands and thousands of years. Tonight, when I talk about aliveness, and I'm going to do this because there's like five techniques I want to run you through tonight, and I was informed that because they locked the doors precisely at 9.30, that I need to stop at about quarter after, which means I'll probably stop at about 25 after and we all have to run for the door. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I want to make sure that we have time to run through some of the techniques. Now, when I talk about techniques, for those of you who have been to my workshops, you know some of what I do. For those who haven't, there, uh, you could call them meditation, but that would be describing them in a way that would put them in a category with other things that they're very different from. It's using your mind to direct energy in the body. They're called bioregenesis techniques. And the purpose of them is to begin waking things up in your body that have to do with the spiritual integration process. It's not just taking your mind on meditation journeys. There are ways of using the mind, because the mind is a generator of scalar wave patterns, which are wave forms, electromagnetic wave forms, that interact with certain parts of the body and the DNA. These are the things that spirituality is about. These are the, the types of information that have been known by the masters for thousands of years, but have not been shared with the public, because there has been an information repression campaign that's been going on in our world for many thousands of years. So when I do meditations, when I take you on little journeys, I'm trying to get you to where you can exercise some of the things that belong to you that you might not realize you had. And once you realize you have them, you can take them home and play with them and begin expanding. So we're going to do some exercises tonight, which means I'm going to have to cut my dialogue short till about 8.30. I'll talk with you about things. I'll describe things to you and share with you information. And after that point, I want to make sure, because if there's anything that's going to help grab that aliveness in you. It's not just talking about things that can make you find the aliveness. It's walking you through some of them. Getting your body and your mind used to moving in ways that it might not be used to doing. That's how you start to feel the aliveness more. And when you start to feel it more, that's when you start, your conscious mind kind of goes, ooh, that was a little different. There is another place that my mind can go and I feel certain things in my body when that happens. This is how your expansion starts. The reason I teach spirituality 
isn't because I needed a job. <laughs> I was an artist <laughs> before I got doing this. <laughs> Spirituality holds the key to our freedom. All of the things in our world that make us unhappy, that make us stressed out, that we look at our world and want to cry because things are going so bad in certain areas and maybe in, even in our own lives. I teach spirituality because it's a way to genuine empowerment. And I teach spirituality in a way that's very deep and very personal. That has to do with your relationship directly to source. Not with your relationship to a priest or a rabbi. Not with your relationship to having to follow rules set down in books that have been manipulated for 2,000 years. Okay? You take what's good in the books and the stuff that's really holding you back, let it go. Just let it bounce off. We teach a type of spirituality that honors all religions. It, re it honors the good parts of them. The parts that are honestly teaching you to make a connection with source through you. It's your birthright. You were born as a human being and human beings were born as an angelic race. This is something that was edited out of our religious teachings. We were told that we were sinners tell you something, God didn't put those words in those books. The inspiring words that teach us to aim higher and never forget God and embrace that presence and love God, God gave us those words. But there were other words put in with the text that have to do with human beings who wanted to control other human beings. This is why when I'm talking about aliveness and waking up and beginning to be part of the club called Sleepers Anonymous. A sleeper is a person who walks around believing everything they're told through the media, through what their parents were told as children. They believe there's nothing else and they just follow rules that somebody else set. And because of that, they're very easy to control, direct, and manipulate. That is a sleeper. And sleepers don't realize the danger they're in, in this society, where there's lots of people who would like to control and manipulate you and take your energy. The antidote to being a sleeper is being awake. And there are ways to become awake if we can get out of our own way. Part of the ways to become awake are realizing we have an aliveness that moves through us. It's been with us since the day we were born, and it'll be with us even after our bodies are dead. Maybe our bodies won't even die, because if we learn how to tap into our aliveness, you can change what the DNA does, which means you can change the fact that we're told human beings have to die. They don't. They didn't used to. They've been dying real fast for about, since about 25,500 BC. But before that time, lifespans were much, much longer. And some people were able to leave here, leave this planet to other places, taking their bodies with them. That is the angelic human heritage. This is what, you can go to churches, synagogues for the next 200 years. And as long as they're using just the old books, you're not going to learn this. I look at it this way, if all the religions had it, you know how they each say, oh, well, we've got the truth? The ones who have the truth aren't here anymore. They ascended. They got out of here. The fact that those people who are so dedicated and who have followed just the books and they're afraid to look any further beyond or within for the presence of spirit, if they had the whole truth and nothing but the truth, they probably wouldn't be on the planet anymore. Because you're not supposed to be stuck here in your evolution from now until eternity, until you evaporate into space dust. That's not what humans are created for. The type of spirituality I teach, and I'm trying to make a bridge here between the people who already know this, who've been listening to me for a while, and the people who are just encountering what I have to say. Because I've said a lot before this. So without that amount of information that some of the others have had, it may be very startling to hear some of the things that I say, and I'm trying to make the transition easy for you. The things that I say that might seem confusing, there are a lot of other things. We have tapes from all the other workshops and things, so if there's things you're interested in that don't make sense because you don't have the information, it is available to you. You know, that way I can, you know, you can get introduced to the things. You might get a little lost on some things, but the other people will also get what they came for, and I think it'll work. So when I talk about aliveness, one of the things I want to address first is consciousness. Now that's something we all have. We're obviously conscious. But what is consciousness and where does it come from? If we buy into exclusively what the scientific experts tell us, they tell us that consciousness, well that's simply a byproduct of interactions of electrical circuitry in the biological brain. And then of course, once the biological brain stops functioning, you don't have consciousness anymore which means you're gone. This is what science is teaching you. These are the experts. 
Now, of course, there's the other conflicting experts, the spiritual ones that tell you, God made consciousness, God made you. And then they give you a set of terms that in order to use your consciousness and have your consciousness, there are certain things you have to do or you will not be loved, you will not go to heaven, you will not be able to experience your consciousness in a joyful way. So we have two paradigms in our society that we've been raised with. Religion was the foundation of societies up until maybe 200 years ago when science started to become the new God. Neither of them have the whole truth. What I like to share with people is the fact that you were born with more truth stored in your cells than you can find in any book in any library here. If you learn to tap into that truth, you will not need the books and libraries anymore because you have your own living library right within your DNA template to get that information, to begin understanding where you came from, why you're here, what it means to be here, what you're a part of. You need to learn to open up the body and have it speak to you. Open up the mind and let the body speak. The consciousness is not a byproduct of any type of biological function. Biological function is a product of consciousness. It works the other way around. There are certain life force energies that exist in the universe, not just in humans, but the whole universe is fueled by energy. That energy is conscious energy. All energy is conscious energy. What that implies is not only are you conscious, but so is your little toe. So is your refrigerator in its own type of consciousness because all of it is made out of frequencies of energy. When we bring that concept home and bring it into, okay, I'm a being, I have a body, I have a consciousness, now what? It didn't come with a set of instructions. There's no like owner's manual to the human body these days. The owner's manual is in your cells. There is information there that can lead you and guide you. What I want to talk about tonight in our aliveness, in talking about aliveness and identifying more of what that means, are the creation currents, currents of energy that fuel this universe. They come from source or God or whichever you call. If you want to call your God Allah, if you want to call it Jehovah, it doesn't matter what you call that beingness, that one consciousness that we all came from. We all originally came from that one consciousness. But so did the basics of physics, how energy works in a manifest system. In the basics of physics, Spirituality and science go hand in hand. There's no difference between the two. When you look at science, the way it's practiced out there, it is soulless. It has no understanding that the fact that there is spirit and spirit is eternal and it lives on way beyond the manifestations of form. When you look at religion, it teaches you there's nothing, there's nothing scientific at all about spirituality. It's about putting your power on somebody else's words and making sure you pay whatever it is you have to pay to make whoever it is that's in control happy so you can get through to wherever heaven is. Neither of those paradigms teach you about your aliveness or how to use it. Neither of those paradigms teach you to use your God-given gift. You were created, humans were created as manifestations of the face of God. They were created as little pieces of God. God wanted to experience what it means to be manifest and so created many forms, one of them human. If we begin to realize that there is not a huge separation, God's not out there someplace else in the universe flying around or sitting on a throne, and you're way down here in this lowly little world, you start to realize you have a living connection to God at all times. God isn't dead. God didn't write the Bible and then, like, you know, take a hike to another universe. <laughs> that presence will always be with us. If we did not have a Bible, or we didn't have a Koran, or we didn't have a Torah, or any of the books, the books were just teachings to get us to a place where we could start to recognize the fact that spirit and God live within us. Those things, those spiritual things, God, spirit, they live within us, but not as hypothetical, conceptual things that have no tangibility. We have a program, it's an audio program, so it's called Tangible Structure of the Soul. Some of you have used it already. This begins to show you the beginnings of that tangible structure of your soul because there is an energy structure that's part of your anatomy, part of your body that holds your aliveness and your consciousness into form. If you can begin to understand, it's kind of like we're walking around with an anatomy and it's as if we identified the fact that we had one leg and two arms 
we're not going to get very far as long as we're dragging that other leg because we don't realize we have it. We have anatomy that's multidimensional. It's 15-dimensional. We have our chakra systems, our bioenergetic fields, our DNA template that spans 12 of the 15 dimensions. When we begin to understand the anatomy that we're dealing with as a human being, we get to have the opportunity to master that, which means we have the ability to master our spiritual integration process. We don't have to hand our power over to some angel because it tells us it knows more about becoming spiritual than we do. We've been tricked into believing those things. Because as long as we're putting our power out on something else, we will never be able to use the power because we're telling ourselves we don't have it. The power I'm speaking of is the power of consciousness, the power of multidimensional consciousness that exists within our bodies right now and it's what's running your bodies. If you didn't have these intrinsic conscious energy systems, you would not be able to walk a body around. Your body wouldn't be alive and your consciousness wouldn't be focused in it. When we're going to understand the structure of our multidimensional anatomy, the structure of our spiritual identity, there's a lot of parts to it. And we've given workshops on explaining some of those parts. The Cathar Bao Spiritual Healing System shows us the, very intricately the interaction between the parts of our anatomy. But if we're going to understand it in the most simple of terms, because sometimes simple is better. You can start with simple and then you can have all the detail you want with some of the other programs. But if there is one thing that I could teach people about to help them get their aliveness back, and when you get your aliveness back, you start to realize you have the power to create joy. You have the power and the choice. There's one thing that I could teach you about that would begin to open that in you. It's something called creation currents, currents of living conscious energy in the form of frequency that move into and through your body through very specific structures. There are primal creation currents that the universe itself is structured on. They're considered universal kundalini currents. You know, some people have heard the word kundalini before, and some haven't. Kundalini is usually used in traditional, I believe it came out of Sanskrit teachings. It was used to describe energy that's supposedly coiled at the base of the spine, that if you learn how to activate things and you learn to be spiritual, it crawls up the spine and you get to have abilities that regular human beings don't. Well, that's what came down in the teachings. There was a lot of other teachings that were uh, purposely taken out of those teachings. Because Kundalini, it's not a negative thing. A lot of people uh, associate it with like Tantra, which they associate with sex. So they think, ah, Kundalini means sex. Uh, not exactly. It can, you know, it has, it's part of that process, but it's, it's part of breathing and it's part of thinking. <laughs> so when we talk about Kundalini energies, there are several areas of Kundalini energies, several different types of frequencies that run your body. If you could think of your body as having a pillar of light that moves through from the top of the universe all the way through where time doesn't even exist anymore to an area that's called the primal sound field. Because first, there was consciousness. There always is consciousness. That is God. Then, from that consciousness within itself, God created a primal field of vibration, of sound. That area is called the kundare, the current that flows down into manifestation from that current we refer to as the kundare or the rainbow ray because it carries with it the frequencies of the spectrum of all light and all sound. That would be the first primal creation current coming into manifestation from source through the sound fields. You have primal light fields, the first place where light begins by the interaction of sound vibrations. Light is created by the interaction of sound vibrations. So there's a physics to this. The sound and the light are conscious. There forms consciousness, the consciousness of God takes, as it begins to move into the experience of manifestation. The primal light fields are referred to as the kirashe. So we have the kundare, which is the sound field current, and then we have connecting to that coming down into manifestation, the kirashe, which is the light field current. From there, we move into something called dimensionalized structure, which means currents, the primal currents, are broken down into different frequency bands, different groupings of vibration that are separated from each other a bit to give consciousness the ability to enter into the experience of frozen light. Frozen light is matter. Frozen light and sound is matter. 
Frozen means it's moving at a different rate than the creation currents through which it is manifest. There is a geometrical relationship between the creation currents, the primal creation currents, that creates the foundation of dimensional structure. So you can basically look at it as God created sound, then light, then the structure of dimensions, which gives us something called the time matrix. It is a matrix of energy, of dimensionalized energy, that consciousness from God can move into, into individuated manifestation. So we live in a time matrix. Now, in the time matrix, it's actually a 15-dimensional time matrix. Dimensions 15, 14, and 13, the first dimensions coming in, they represent the Kirache primal light fields. From there, form comes in to pre-matter, which would be dimensions 12, 11, and 10. That's called pre-matter. Pre-matter is also called liquid light, because if you could see it, it would look like pale silver mercury, liquid light. It's conscious light. This is where your consciousness begins. Before you take on a full form or a physicality, you have a part of your consciousness that comes in from God, a part stays in the sound fields, a part of it stays in the light fields, a part of it stays in the pre-matter liquid light fields. That part is also referred to, the pre-matter liquid light fields are also referred to as the universal Christos. It is the area before form differentiation is taken by consciousness that unites all forms that are manifest in our time matrix. It is the inner Christos. This is what Jesus came to teach us about. These were the original teachings that were in the Bible until 325 AD when the Council of Nicaea raped the Bible and took out 90% of its books. Part of them are still hidden in Rome. This is information that can set you free because if you understand the first, you move through sound, then through light, and you stay there. Part of your consciousness stayed in each of those places. Then through pre-matter liquid light. Then into dimensional structure. Hmm. Now, when you get into pre-matter liquid light, you're at dimension 12. That is the Christos frequency. From there, you begin to take on individuation of form, going into dimension 11, into 10, into 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right here, we're in dimensions 1, 2, and 3. We have a three-dimensional body system. The creation currents that we followed down to come into manifestation went from the Christos level to three levels of the Christos level, 12, D12, D11, and D10. The next part of those creation currents, as they're breaking down further, getting smaller so they can fit in the smaller packages, is called the Antankarana. This is dimensions 9 through 1, the frequency spectrum that came out of the larger Kirache and Kundare primal sound and light fields and the D12 Christos. Christos breaks itself down to form smaller creation currents, and they are called the Antankarana. That is a Sanskrit word also, I believe. The D12 part of this pillar of light, sound, and consciousness that's coming down is called the Maharata. That's simply the sound tones, that if you could hear the frequencies of those dimensional bands, they would be the sounds that those tones would make, but they're inaudible sound to the, to the external ear. So the words like Maharata, Nantankarana, these are words, Kirache, that you would hear if you could hear the whispers of the vibrations of sound and light. If you could hear the light waves that make up the Kirache, they would sound like Kirache. There's, these are the songs of God. A lot of people like to call them, in the ancient days, they call them that, the whisper of God, the song of God, the song of the universe, the silent symphony that we're all a part of. Now, with the Antankarana, if we can look at this, we can look at our basic creation very simply by realizing, okay, we have dimensions one through nine, we have this pillar of frequency that is our consciousness that forms our body parts from dimension one through nine. That's our Antankarana. It's pillar of frequency. Above that, plugging the Antankarana in closer to God, we have the Maharata, the D12, 11, and 10 part of that frequency current. Above that, we have the Kirache. And above that, we have the Kundare. And above that, we have full expansion into source. This pillar of frequency that our consciousness travels down to get into manifestation is precisely the same way you get back out of manifestation. You rebuild the frequency pillar. The body is geared to rebuild the frequency pillar. When we're walking around in three-dimensional reality, we're seeing a three-dimensional world because of our DNA template. 
our DNA template is the blueprint, the divine blueprint of light and sound that our physical DNA template and everything physical built on it is created from. The DNA template of the human being was originally created as a minimum of 12 strands. Certain types of human beings called indigo children have anywhere from 24 to 48 strands. This is why we were considered an angelic human race, because anything that has 12 strand potential in its DNA template has the ability to integrate a minimum of 12 dimensions of consciousness, which means it has the ability to pull in all of the frequencies of the Antan Karana, D1 through D9, and it also has the abilities to pull in the frequencies of D10, 11, and 12. It can pull in the pale silver liquid light Christos frequency and the consciousness that goes with it. A being with a 12-strand template has the ability to hold Christ consciousness in physically embodied form. We were created to do that. We have been denied this knowledge, the teachings of the inner Christ. And you can be any religion and believe in the teachings of the inner Christ. You don't have to believe that somebody died on a cross to be a person who recognizes the inner Christ. It doesn't matter what you call your God. But I'd be real careful about what God I'd call if they're telling me I don't have an inner Christ. Because something's wrong with that picture. Your systems, your body systems, if you could see yourself with higher vision, you would see everybody's body has a current of energy running through the center of it. It's called the central vertical current. This is the place where the creation currents of the Antankarana, the Maharada, the Kirishe, and the Kundare run directly into your body. It starts at fetal integration. It starts with the first of the first eight cells that are the first cells at the base of the spine and the tailbone when fetal integration occurs and cell division starts. The first thing to enter fetal integration is called the Christos spark. It is a spark of consciousness and a spark of frequency of D12 prematter liquid light. Prematter is also called hydroplasm, but that's a technical word for it. It's the Christos frequency, and that's where you get your consciousness into your body. That's what gives you the potential to expand that body and the consciousness within it to the point where it has full recognition of 12 dimensions of consciousness. And a body that has full recognition of 12 dimensions of consciousness has the ability to transmute its cellular structure. It does not get sick. It does not die. It can ascend. What is ascension? That's another one of those big tricky ones that they teach you about and teach you to want in the spiritual traditions. What they don't teach is how exactly do you get there? Well, as long as you really be nice and a certain God likes you, you might ascend. <laughs> you know, Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. If we can understand ascension is also a natural process of what it means to be human and a natural process and function of a time matrix, the basic primal structure that our universe is created on, it takes the taboo out of it, that big question mark, what could that possibly be? I can't understand it, so how could I ever make it happen? Ascension is a natural process of evolution. When consciousness comes into the time matrix, following the primal creation currents, it comes through series of what are called portals, or stargates, that exist within each dimensional field that allows the consciousness to pass through. Ascension is stargate passage. We are created through the process of passing our consciousness through different density levels in, through the stargates to get into a physical form. The process by which we ascend is to go back up through the stargates. Now, in some of the more technical workshops, I've taught about the structure of the time matrix. And I'll just review it real quick for the people who weren't here before. We have a 15-dimensional time matrix. Those 15 dimensions are broken down into sets of three dimensions. Each of those three dimensions is called a harmonic universe, and there are five harmonic universes within a 15-dimensional time matrix. Each harmonic universe has a characteristic level of matter density to it. Density one, we are in density one, dimensions one, two, and three. This is the most solid that matter gets. This is the physical gross matter density. If you took a stargate between density one and density two, you would go into semi-etheric matter, which means if you got your body through it, it would be about half as dense as it is right now, and it would have abilities that you can't do down here in a body that's as dense as this. You would have instant telepathic abilities. You would have the ability to 
put yourself in four different places at once if you wanted, or 200 different places, by location. You would have the ability to realize that you're a thought form, <laughs> even down here in physicality. We are walking thought forms. We have more control over our bodies, over our lives, over our processes than we've ever been told by the books that have been around for the last several thousand years. Once upon a time, there were some really good books here. <laughs> About 200,000 years ago, there were races of humans on this planet that knew this stuff by heart. They had open access to stargates. They knew how to walk through. And you know what's neat about them? Because they had control over the, the DNA template, they didn't have to eat. They were called breatharians. They could bring in enough frequency, enough energy directly from the air and from the planet that they didn't need to eat. Obviously, there are certain organs they didn't need if they didn't need to eat. So their biologies were a bit different. Their density level was a bit different. The matter that we're walking around in down here is more solid than it was ever meant to be. Human bodies were never designed to be this solid. The reason they've become this solid is because there have been mutations purposely done to our gene code to keep us locked in time. We've been incarnating over and over again down here because our DNA templates have been damaged. What's nice is when we begin to understand the primal creation currents, that simple pillar of light that has a few different names to the different pieces of it, we have the ability to regenerate our 12-strand DNA template, bring it out of the closet, bring it out of dormancy, and start healing it where we can progressively reclaim our heritage. As we reclaim our heritage, we reclaim a sensitivity. We start to understand more about how our body works. We can understand, for instance, that when you start to activate, as we call it, activating the DNA template, this is bringing frequency into the body that the body's not used to holding anymore. For thousands of years, we've been running on three dimensions of frequency, three frequency bands. We start to wake up the dormant parts of our DNA template by using the mind to direct energy in certain ways. The body starts to wake up, and it creates some very strange sensations. <laughs> you will feel when kundalini starts to activate. It feels like something crawling up the back of your spine. There are real physical sensations that go with this. It's not just lip service to spirituality. But every piece of frequency from the higher dimensional fields that you're able to anchor in this body and awaken by awakening the part of the DNA template that is composed of those frequencies but is sleeping right now, every part that you bring in brings more consciousness in. You begin to remember more of who you are, who you were, what you came here for, how you got here. You begin to realize you're eternal. So a few things go right out the window. Fear of death, you can't kill something eternal. Yeah. You can make a change its clothes and make its body go away, but it's not going to change the fact that it's eternal. You buy into the idea of science is feeding us, and you're going to be terrified of death because you feel small and insignificant, and there's no, there's no purpose in being because you're going to live like you know, 72 to maybe 120 years, and then it's going to be all over, and nobody cares. You're, you know, 20 years from now, nobody will even remember you. That's how it feels when you believe the science paradigm as it is. Now, if you believe the spiritual paradigms as they're being given to us over the last couple of thousand years, you'll be really afraid of death, too, because what if I really screwed up? You know, what if whoever it is that got up there doesn't like me and, and doesn't let me come into heaven? Does that mean I have to go to hell and deal with the devil who's going to poke me with pitchforks and burn me? You know, I mean, these are the things that we're taught to believe. And that maybe 15,000 years ago, maybe at a stage of development called like Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon, maybe these were good things to teach a race of beings. But we've evolved beyond the usefulness of what we've been taught. We need to know more. And the thing is, the knowledge is in us. Our DNA template holds the key to bringing in those other parts of our consciousness that we left behind in the higher dimensional fields. We had to leave them behind up there because they wouldn't all fit down here. So as we expand and begin to activate strands 4 through 12 of the 12 strand DNA template that's our heritage, we begin to bring in fourth dimensional consciousness, which is astral awareness, fifth dimensional, sixth dimensional. When we get up to twelfth dimensional consciousness, we are what is called an avatar, a Christed being, that has the ability to consciously regulate how the DNA template works. That means you can shut off certain DNA so you can be physical. If you want to not be physical, you can turn it back on and go someplace else. This is the heritage. This is what God created us to be and to do. Now, in the workshops that we're going to cover in the next 
two days, we're going to get into some very interesting things. First of all, we're going to cover something that when, it was, when the information was given to me and explained as, as it has been with the detail, a part of me, I, I guess all the tears come to my eyes because it struck a memory, a memory that lived in me all the time. What was the human collective created for? The human evolutionary design had a sacred mission. It's a mission that's been omitted out of the books by people who didn't want us to remember so we wouldn't get to fulfill the mission. We had a planetary service mission that we as angels came in here to do. We're going to get into that on Saturday's workshop. We're going to get into some of the secrets that have been hidden within our legends, within the legends that came out from the Christ period, within the legends of King Arthur, within the legends of Atlantis, was it real, was it not? We're going to get in to understanding where those legends came from, because in those legends there's a secret, a secret that tells us about what our divine mission was and how as we fulfill it, we set the planet free, and as we set the planet free, we set ourselves free. So we're going to get into some of the detail. This information, I know for a fact, has not been on planet since 10 AD was the last time. 10 AD was when a man named Jeshua, Jeshua Melchizedek, a.k.a. Jesus Christ, brought this information here in the same way that it's being given now. He translated it off something called Cloister Doratura plates, CDD plates. These are metal discs that were given to this race in 246,000 BC when this race was awake. They were plates that held the history records and the mechanics, the mechanics of something called the Templar, which is the planet's energy system, how our systems are connected to the planet's system and how the stargates of this system are to be regulated. Why, did we, why were we given that knowledge? Because we had been appointed as guardians of Earth's stargates. Right now, the only time we think of the word stargate is in the fiction movies on TV. That's because the last time the stargates here opened was in 208,216 BC. That's a long time ago. There were written records explaining it. They were taken from us by certain groups that did not want us to remember. The stellar activation cycle, or stargate opening cycle that happened 200,000 years ago, went bad because we were invaded. We were invaded by races from other systems, from density two, which is dimension four, five, and six. We call them the fallen angelics. You can call them ETs too if you want to, but when you say ET, you miss the point of the fact that they have the ability to move through density levels. We forget that we have the ability to move through density levels too. So we're going to get into, on Sunday, some interesting things. I'm going to reveal something that, uh, <laughs> that I'm actually putting my life on the line to reveal. It's a plan that was called the Atlantean Conspiracy. The evolution and the history that we have been raised with are part of a much bigger story. And when we begin to see what that story is, we start to realize what is happening right now. This is the long-anticipated stellar activation cycle. They have been waiting for this stellar activation cycle. Our higher parts, our soul, our higher levels, and also the fallen angelics who want control of this planet. The year 2000, the years 2000 to 2017, is the first time a stellar activation cycle will happen since 200,000 years ago. And here we are, 99% sleepers on this planet. The reason we were put here was because there's damage to the planetary grids, the Templar, that we were supposed to help fix. Because if we don't fix it, every time Earth hits a stellar activation cycle, which is part of its natural cycle and its evolutionary time cycle, stellar activation cycles, stargate opening cycles, are natural. Every time Earth goes into one with damaged planetary grids, without humans on the planet to do what they're supposed to do, it rolls. It goes into pole shift. This is why you have the prophecies that have been coming up for thousands of years through the Mayans and through the Egyptians and through the Native Americans and, and even through the Bible. Why this time period was singled out as the end times. Because there were those who understood the time cycles. We can stop that from happening. The reason we haven't been told how to stop it from happening is because there are certain forces that want it to happen to clear the real estate. We need to wake up at least some of us, enough of us. 
we need to remember what it means to have a Kundare, Kirashe, Maharada, Antankarana, because they are our life force currents. And it is through our life force currents that we can wake our DNA up, wake our body up, but we can also do the repair to the planetary grids that will stop the place from rolling, even though fallen angelics are trying to make it do that right now. The information that I'm going to share between you know, tonight and tomorrow and Sunday, some of it, <laughs> they say controversy sells, well, whoa, <laughs> this, some of this is going to challenge everybody's belief system because it's going to show you some things in history. And you're going to find some popular names in history that our stories have told us to love and worship and honor. And we're going to find out some things about them that you might want to think twice. Hopefully by the end of the workshops, you will be able to walk out of the room, possibly a little stunned, but <laughs> more than stunned, empowered. You will be able to look at the little pieces of teachings and the, the, the conflicting ideas about what was our past, what, you know, what happened in history, what does it mean now. These things will not be so confusing if you start to see what has happened here. But the big thing is, we've always focused, as right Temple focuses on, I focus on solutions. If there is a problem and there is no solution to it, ignorance is bliss. You're better off not knowing. If the place was going to roll and there wasn't a darn thing anybody could do, we might as well, I would just be out here teaching, let's party, let's have a spiritual party day, let's really get our soul in line here in case, <laughs> so, you know, when we're going to meet our maker, it's like a good time to clean out the closets and, you know, get ourselves together. That's not the message I have to teach, though. The message I've been asked and guided to teach is a message that we can make a difference here, but it's like now or never. <laughs> you know, the stellar activation cycle we're in the middle of started in the year 2000. It was consummated in the year 2000, which means the lower gates that go with dimension 1, 2, and 3 began to open. And gate 4, which is the beginning of fourth dimensional frequency coming into this planet. If the stellar activation cycle was going normally and there weren't problems, by the year 2012, something called the Halls of Amente Stargates, which are a smaller stargate system interwoven with Earth's stargate system that go directly up to density 2 in Earth's counterpart planet called Terra, they would open and we'd be able to go through them. We're not going to make it to the opening in the Halls of Amente if certain grid work isn't done. And we're not going to be able to do the grid work if we don't remember who we are and we don't remember how to run our bodies. It's not that hard to learn to run your body. The biggest part is realizing you can. The biggest obstacle to that is the programming. We have been mind washed. All right, we have had our memory taken away and on Sunday, I will show you how that was done. I'll show you when it was done and by who it was done and why and how those forces aren't something that messed with us in the past that went, they're still here. Tonight, I want to focus on a little bit of getting it into what tomorrow will be instead of Sunday. Tomorrow, we're going to deal with solutions. Okay? If there's a problem and there's a solution, I like to show you the solution first. Because then by the time you see what the problem is, oh, that's no, no problem. We know how to fix it. Right? Now, if I showed you the problem first, you might say, oh, God, I don't want to deal with this anymore. You know? So what we do is we teach you the solutions. The solutions are empowering. Because they're not only saying, hey, guys, can we wake up and somebody please help this planet before we all go down? That's not the purpose of it alone. It's saying, find, claim what is yours as a person, as a being. You came here for a reason. Somewhere in there you have memory. Somewhere in those cells you have memory of your blessedness and why you were created as a face of God to walk this planet at this time. When you can start to find that inside of you, you start to feel that living presence waking up, you can look around and think about the things that used to bother you before you started feeling that presence, and all of a sudden, what seemed like this big becomes like this big. So I don't like my job? Well, I'm a manifester. I guess I'll shift it, won't I? I'll create something better. You know, I was told I was stupid or ugly or, or fat or couldn't do, couldn't do. Hmm, if you recognize that as a belief program, you are a creator. You are created in the image of God. As a face of God, you have the ability to use your creative power you're supposed to. And say, wait a minute, I don't like that filter. If you kind of look at your thoughts, as templates, as molds that will direct the consciousness energy out into a manifestation, you start to realize you, you can do things like God can do. Maybe not as big yet, 
you know, I mean, you know, you're not going to go create universes and worlds right away. <laughs> but you could at least create a happier life for yourself and, like, get out of a job you don't like and, you know, find a nice relationship you do like. There are real practical benefits on a daily basis of learning what you're made of and learning why you're on the planet. And when you get to that point of realizing, yeah, for personal reasons I can do this, then you start to realize, you know, I'm part of a bigger collective. I'm part of an, an, an angel race. And oh my God, 90% of the angel race is still asleep. <laughs> then you start to see where what you do has tremendous significance as to what this world is going to turn into. If you don't want to see volcanoes and earthquakes and tidal waves and rolling planets between now and 2012, it's a good time to get motivated to say, hmm, I'm going to reclaim myself because I want my power back. But I'm going to use that power to help because, well, if it all falls apart around me, my playground's gone, <laughs> you know? You can make a difference in what happens here on a huge level. All it takes are small handfuls of people who activate their Kundare, Kirishe, Maharada, and Antikarana currents. A person who has those frequencies activated in the body, which are called Kundalini activations, have the ability to hold energy in the planetary grids in a way that can literally change the electromagnetic balances in the planet's electromagnetic fields, which means you can stop a place, a planet, from rolling if there's a critical mass of people that can do that. That's what we're trying to train people to do. Not just to help the world, but you're on this world. If this world's going to, it's like Spaceship Earth. If it's going to move through a battle zone, if it's going to go into trouble, there's nowhere to jump off. You can't, like, jump over to Pluto and hang out there until the dust settles. You know? Our DNA is keyed to the planetary grids. We're stuck here. Unless we free our DNA, which helps to free the planetary grids. But the stuff we're going to learn, there's a fun part to becoming response or response able there is a joy in learning the aliveness that lives within you because before you go worry about saving the planet you know just work on your life you can say wow I have this power I can use this power I can make changes in my life there are things that we're going to go through tomorrow that show you bigger things where you fit as a human being what was this angelic human race created for how was it created what does that mean to you? You're a part of it. Even the bag ladies on the street are part of it. The only problem is they forgot. If you remember, you will never be a bag lady on the street again unless you choose to do so so you can affect the other people walking by that are asleep. Sometimes masters appear in bag lady form <laughs> specifically to reach the street people. Well, so don't underestimate all bag ladies. <laughs> what I would like to do tonight, since we have a short time tonight, this was you know, like the introductory lecture, to get in touch with the aliveness that's in us, it involves becoming sensitive. Sensitive to energies that we don't usually point our mind to looking for. If we're going to activate our higher consciousness in our body, we need to realize that's a physical thing we're going to do to our body. This isn't an intangible, oh, I'll anchor my soul and it'll be fine. This is, oh dear, I'm bringing a new frequency into my body and my cells are probably going to scream because <laughs> they haven't had that frequency in thousands of years. There's biophysical processes involved in becoming soul integrated and over soul integrated and avatar integrated. Anything that affects your DNA template, which soul integration and the rest does, is going to create changes in your body. There are some parts, kind of like turning on the circuitry in a, in a house that's been vacant for 10 years and you go and you flip the lights, Hopefully they work well. <laughs> you, know, you might get a lot of flickering here and bared wires there. It takes a while for the juice to get flowing when you start to activate those consciousness currents in your body. There are things you can do to prepare your body so it's not as difficult. Now, there are numbers of people that are aware that they're going through DNA activations. They've had all sorts of different symptoms. In one of the, uh, the coping skills workshop that I gave last year, which we do have, I think, on video or at least audio, um, we got into coping skills for the year 2000 to 2017 because our DNA is going to activate whether we want it to or not. The planetary grids are activating from the Stargate's opening. What it means is right now we're carrying mutations in the DNA template. So as the templates try to activate, they're going to throw frequency all over the place. and It's going to cause people health problems, some people mental problems, emotional problems. The DNA activation courses that we're using 
are meant to help people clear those mutations using the Christos template, the Maharada ray, the D12 frequency, which is the first level of non-polarized frequency. It's not electromagnetic anymore. It's called photoradionic. When we bring in that frequency into the body, it will reset, if we do it enough, it will reset the natural structure of the DNA template as it was originally created, because that is our pre-matter blueprint, our divine Christos blueprint. As we reset that in the body, our DNA will reorder itself. What science calls junk DNA will start to unjunk itself. It'll start to plug itself back in where it belonged. So we're gonna learn these processes, and we're gonna learn ways to make the body more comfortable while they're happening. Because some of the symptoms of DNA activation are, a lot of you may even be having them already, you just don't realize that that's what they are. All right, one of the symptoms is joint and bone pain. That seems to cycle. Who doesn't these days, right? It's like a deep pain that just comes in the bones. Sometimes you can feel it in the bones, sometimes it's just the joints. You have a lot of people wandering around thinking, God, am I arthritic? I'm only 20, you know what I mean? Many, many times. It is an arthritis. You go to the doctor, are they going to look for DNA activation? Not. No, they're going to give you arthritis drugs that are going to make it worse. You know? They're going to make it worse if it's DNA activation because arthritis drugs can't fix DNA activation. They'll only block the process more. We need to become aware really fast that some of the physical symptoms and mental symptoms and emotional symptoms that we're going to go through are not something that medical science is yet ready to deal with at all. They don't recognize the fact that we have a template underneath the little pieces of physical DNA that they can identify. They think we have two strands, and I hate to tell them we're operating on three right now or we'd be two-dimensional creatures. All right, if we rely on science right now, we're gonna have some real problems with our bodies. The people out there we call the sleepers. They're gonna go through some tough times, but some of those tough times will get to them to the point where they wanna wake up and they'll be guided to things because they have a soul just like anybody else. Their souls will be guiding them to wake up. Now, if we understand a little bit about our body systems, and we can understand simply, without going through all the 15-dimensional anatomy that we've taught and some of the other things, just realize there is this current of light, of light and sound frequency, that's moving down from God all the way through the dimensional structure through us. And right now, there's only a certain part of that current awake in the body, three dimensions worth of it. The DNA template has the ability to open its little windows like little scalar wave patterns that once they come alive, they can run the higher frequencies. We can realize the simple process of DNA, DNA activation is the process of building those currents. What will happen is the main vertical current in the body will get bigger. It will expand progressively. It will do that because the frequencies that run from the base of the spine up to the pineal gland and then out the chakra systems, they will be bringing more frequency in. It will widen the pillar of light inside of you. And eventually, if you get to 12-strand activation, that pillar of light will not be only inside of you. It will extend all the way around you. It's called the ascension pillar because through that, you can make a Merkaba vehicle happen, which means you can literally demanifest here, go through a stargate, and pop up someplace else. That's the potential we have. And the funny thing is, it's not just like a hypothetical potential. We don't deal with hypothetical stuff where I come from. <laughs> we deal with things that work. Science explores to find out what might work. It assumes that nobody knows. God knows. <laughs> there are races of beings. There is the human race in other space-time locations that know. There is a set way that things work. It's not hypothetical guessing. There's a very simple process involved with the body, when you bring in frequency, it expands that frequency into the body. It changes how the chakras work. It changes how certain glandular structures work. It brings the pineal gland back into activation that's been dormant for thousands of years. It's been dormant because they shut the kundalini currents off at the base of the spine, so you didn't have the energy going up there anymore. With the pineal gland activating, you get multidimensional perception. You get the ability to directly influence what your cellular structure is doing. You can heal yourself. You don't have to run to doctors every time something's falling apart. These are some of the immediate advantages you have by learning your anatomy, and you don't have to be intimidated by your anatomy. You know, if you get an anatomy book and you just want to learn about the physical, and you look at all the huge names of things and stuff they have, you can get anatomy books like this, to the point where you just don't want to know. I look in the mirror, I've got one, that's enough, you know? <laughs> 
the structure we teach isn't quite that bad. All right, there's basic parts you need to know about. But the most simple thing is realizing that it's the current of energy that runs through your middle that you are expanding. This is the objective. Because if you can do that and simply focus on the fact that what you're doing is building into a bigger pillar, the pillar of light that runs down through you now, that will accomplish the rest. If you do the things that will make that pillar build, that will make the rest happen. You will activate DNA, you will activate the Merkaba vehicle, you will, you will uh, reverse mutate the DNA template, and you will get to the point where you can ascend. If you get to the point where you can run more frequency through your body and through your DNA, you have the ability to interface with the planetary grids to stop this place from rolling because we can hold the Stargate stable, and that's what we're being asked to do. This is a big message to carry to somebody who's never had this work. So I have a lot of compassion for the people who've not had exposure to it before. <laughs> Hang in there. There's lots more from here. Like, we started easier. You know? <laughs> but at this point, we have between the, year, the end of the year 2001 and the middle of the year 2002, this is going to determine whether or not they can stop the place from rolling. If it rolls, it's not going to go in 2002. It's going to slowly go between 2003 and 2012. We can make a difference, but the difference has to be made fast before it's too late to counteract the electromagnetic imbalances that are being made to happen in the grids. We need to do it very simply by activating our DNA template, and then there's some ancient secrets. They were the secrets of the Christ mission, what Jesus was really here to do. He was here to do more than just teach. What King Arthur has to do with all of this? <laughs> was he even real? Yes, he was. He was born in 559 A.D. on a mission. This goes back to Atlantis before both of them. Atlantis was here too. If we can start to understand what has gone on here, in those ancient legends, there is a secret, a secret that was kept from us, so when this time came, we wouldn't have it, so we wouldn't be able to fix it. The secret is called the Round Table. You know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table? Where they weren't, they weren't just a bunch of guys that sat around and talked about politics. <laughs> they were on a mission that had to do with stargates. They had something called the Book of Maps and Keys, which is something that Joshua, or Jesus, also translated. But they took it when they raided the documents at Nicaea. The Book of Maps and Keys showed where the stargates were located here, and it showed what had to be done to regulate them so they would stay balanced. This is the information we're going to get into in the next two days. But before we get into that, I want to be able to ground us into, okay, this big heavy stuff, right? <laughs> Let's come down to just, I'm here, I'm in a body, okay, I just learned, some of you already knew, and some of you just, hmm, okay, I have this pillar of light running through me that each, you know, certain dimensional levels are called different things. Okay, that's not too hard to digest, right? <clears throat> if you're going to make more frequency run through your body, by whatever this mysterious process is of activating DNA. How are you going to make that be a comfortable process for you? Because there are changes, like I said, pain, just you know, periodic periods of uh, the bone pain, the joint pain, that's one of them. Teeth breaking, that's another. Teeth just love to fracture when there's too much frequency coming through. Okay, You can get periods of heat flashes where you're going to run off for estrogen treatment if you're a female because you're going to think you're hitting that time even if you're 20 years too young. <laughs> you know? There are many, many symptoms of DNA activation. When it gets really strong, and if you're going through some very heavy activation cycles, you may even get cracks in your skull. I did. I got one that runs up the back there, and I have another one that runs straight up my forehead and up to the top of my head. Not everybody gets those. That, that tends to be when your soul decides, because you need to have certain levels of awareness with you at a certain time, they have to make your codes activate really fast. They try, your soul will try not to do that. It'll try to pace it as easy as you can. But right now, we are being asked to realize this is going to happen. We're going to be a part of this, whether we do it consciously or as a sleeper. But the sleepers aren't going to know what hit them. They're not going to know why their bodies are hurting. They're not going to know why their emotions are jumping all over the place all of a sudden, where everything upsets them, or why sometimes they feel totally distant from everything and not plugged into anything. They're going to have these psychological symptoms. They're going to be really strange because they used to feel like normal people. Normal is going to take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> All right, if we can understand, there are some basic things we can do. One of the things we can do, I'm going to sit up here for this so you can s see, hopefully, the people in the back can see a little bit. One of the things I want to cover is, if we're going to activate the rainbow ray and the Maharata, which we're going to learn to do over the next two days, for those of you who come, there's things in the body 
you got to get your body warmed up to handle this stuff, which means it will make the symptoms of activations less annoying or less painful. Major headaches are another part of the symptoms. Some people, when your pineal is starting to get stimulated, you'll get what feel like migraines, or you'll get severe eye pain, or you'll get periods of blurred vision, or you'll have periods where your ears seem like they shut off. <laughs> and the one big one that drives everybody buggy <laughs> is sometimes it feels like somebody just took your memory and ran away with it. Where did it go? I used to be, I used to have a photographic memory. What happened to my memory? God, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> <You know? laughs> These are part of the process. It's like, don't go, don't go get the Alzheimer's test right now, okay? Let's check this out first, because at least we're not asking you to take drugs to fix it, right? The memory loss is part of the fact that your body is a vessel. It is a vehicle built on a certain amount of energy and frequency, and it has a certain capacity to hold X amount of frequency over a certain period of time. At any one moment point, it can only hold so much. Now, if you have a computer, and you throw way too much information into it, it just crashes. It just can't process it anymore. Your body would do that if your soul and your higher consciousness allowed too much to be put through. So when it's time for you to make the transition from being a sleeper to being awake, there's a lot of data, old files, that are really just not that important anymore. You know, they're really just, as far as you being able to grow and expand and learn what you need to learn, and get functional on a higher level here. There are certain things that are just trivial pursuit, and your soul kind of makes that decision. And sometimes that can be frustrating because it's really helpful to be able to find your car keys. <laughs> so the memory issues, they may happen to you sometimes. You don't, you don't need to get scared that your memory just flew away and it's never going to come back, and you know that's like a stage away from being a vegetable. You're not headed in that direction. But be aware that some of these symptoms are going, are, are going to be part of the next 10 years on this planet. The people who don't know why they're here are going to run to doctors, and doctors are going to give them drugs because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> or they're going to say they're hypochondriacs, right? <laughs> yeah, tell me that. My vision is totally blurred, and I can't see more than two feet in front of me. You're telling me I'm making it up. <laughs> you know? So if we can realize that there are simple things that we can do without even understanding a million different technical things about our anatomy. For anybody who wants that, we have the Cathara Biospiritual Healing System and the Tangible Structure of the Soul Program. They're good introductions. But if you want just the simple stuff to start with, there are things you can do to get the body a little more used to running these frequencies that are going to be coming in your, into your being. Now, the human body, part of the anatomy of the human body, has what are called axiotonal lines. Okay, axiotonal lines are main energy running lines that come off that main vertical current. You have the main vertical cre creation currents coming through your body. Now, right now, the creation currents are regulated by what are called cranial sacral seals. These are frequency seals that, if you could see them, would look like little crystalline structures that allow some energy to come through but block out other parts of the energy. They're cranial sacral because there is one set of them in the cranium, in the pineal gland, and another set at the tailbone, at the base of the spine. These regulate how much frequency can come through your main vertical current. As you go through DNA activations, whether you're doing it consciously or having it run over you, those cranial sacral seals are progressively going to release. They're going to let more frequency come in to the main vertical current. And the main vertical current just doesn't hang there all on its own and you kind of like hang on it like a little paper body. There's a whole interwoven system of energy networks that are built off of that main vertical current. You have your chakra systems, which are little vortices of energy, and we have, we have a whole system on chakras for those who don't know it's there, but that's part of the anatomy. You don't need to understand too much immediately about the chakras. When you start getting into meditations, you're going to, because you need to know where to put the energy. If you want to activate strand 10, you need to activate chakra 10. You need to run energy to that. Where might that be? <laughs> so it's helpful to know the positions of the chakras. But one of the other things that manifests through the energy systems are the axiotonal lines. These are main energy feed lines. They're smaller than the main vertical current, but they bring different dimensions of frequency into different areas of the body and the auric field around the body. You can see them with higher sight. If you go up to six strand activation and turn on your vi inner vision at D6 level, you'll be able to see the structure of them. You can see a little bit at D4, but not too much. See, when you turn on the DNA, you also get interdimensional perception progressively opening up. You become psychic, because psychic is a normal state of being for a human being. Now, axiotonal lines are important only in realizing that you have them running through your body 
They're important for a lot of other reasons, but for basic stuff, you want to make yourself more comfortable while you're activating. If you realize you have these energy lines running through your body, and that when the body's not used to processing energy, and all of a sudden the DNA kicks up a whole new burst of new frequency, and it can get jammed up in the cells, and it can get jammed up in the networks, and that's where you get pain, and that's where it hurts. If you do simple things, like massage, simply massaging vertical in the legs, in the arms, the excitonal lines run vertically in the body. They get blocked up. They block up everything built on top of them. They will create chakra blockages. They will create blockages in the smaller networks of energy called the meridian lines. The meridian lines are what acupuncturists use. All right, but below the meridian lines are the deeper axiotonal lines. And below that, there's a core template that's connected to the DNA and the main vertical current. So if we can begin to realize that you can use certain, te yep, use certain techniques like, hmm, I want to make sure I cover all the ones that I said I was going to on the internet. Uh, to wake up the body, I would say use first, moving the muck, we call it. This is where you clear the axiotonal lines. Moving muck is not that hard. Now, we have the Cathar by a spiritual healing system that shows you how to move it from the deepest levels of the template. But if you're laying, you know, you're home watching TV and all of a sudden you're just getting sore. You just feel things are sore. What your body is trying to say to you is, please rub me. Please move the energy in these areas. Soreness, pain, comes from blocked energy. It comes from blockages in the axiotonal lines that become very, very common when your DNA is activating. And since you're on the planet and the grids are activating and your DNA is going to do it whether you want it to or not, it's a good time to realize you have the power right in your fingertips to begin making a difference. To run axiotonal line blockages, because they run on verticals, where meridian lines run vertical, horizontal, and diagonal, the main ones that control the meridians are the axiotonal lines, and they are vertical. Vertical massage running down the body and up the body, and using quite a bit of pressure. Your body will let you know how much pressure. If you rub for a while vertically, or you can have your your partner do it or your mother do it or something. You can do it for each other. It's simply, you don't need to have a, a massage license to do this. You don't need, I'm not going to go and rub you and teach you how to massage and then, you know, have everybody get, you know, tell me I need a license to teach massage. There's nothing wrong with teaching you how. You can simply use your own hands to help your DNA activation process and help yourself feel more comfortable. Vertical, running the lines. You can also use the visualization while you're doing it of running pale silver light. These pale silver light, some people call it the, uh, the platinum ray, that's some in the New Age movement, some refer to it as that. Pale silver light is the liquid light, the D12 frequency. It's available now, it's coming through the planetary grids now, so you can pull it into the body. We have the Maharic seal, um, temporary Maharic seal activation exercise, it's back there, it's free for anybody who wants them. If you run this, you're, you're beginning to bring the D12 frequency into the body. You can run this while you're massaging your legs, your arms, just your body. You can massage your head, do it in vertical stripes, going up your head. Sit there and play with your body for a while. <laughs> I mean, just sit someplace. Take some time and say, okay, I have these lines, huh? I have these lines in my body, okay? I don't feel them, I don't know where they are, but maybe I can find them. Try to find them. Try to rub and start to feel the difference. If I rub over here, do I feel more or less sensation? If I move the finger back an inch, get in touch with your axiotonal lines and you will start to have more control over how you feel during the processes we're going to go through in the next 10 years. There's another part that's very useful. There's another part of the body grids that get blocked when DNA activates rapidly, which it's going to be doing. It's called the dyadic grid. Now, the dyadic grid is simply a name for a level of the body systems that look like a million little vortices. They look like little tiny spirals, little tornadoes of energy. And the whole body, you could, there's a level that you can close your eyes and actually see your body as these billions of points of light. And off every little point of light, there's a little vortice that sticks out. These are called diodes. They have an energy relationship with the part of you that's stationed on parallel Earth in the antiparticle universe. Energy goes between the two of you. All right? You don't need to worry about your parallel self too much. But... <coughs> you can have blockages in the dyadic grid, which means those little vortices and the little light at their center, the light turns dark, and it's like closing a conduit of energy. And what happens there is it builds up energy. It builds up what are called miasmic crystals in that level of the body. 
Miasmic crystals will affect the DNA template and cause distortions there. This is what the karmic pattern is. It's buildups of miasmic crystals that have been coming in from the other time vectors that we're connected to. We'll get into that too tomorrow. <laughs> as far as incarnation, karma, simultaneous time, and what that really means. But for now, if you realize you have these little vortices running all over the body, and they're most healthy and your body is feeling good when those vortices, the little center part of them, the little small part of the cone, is opened. So energy naturally flows for wherever it's coming from over there, which happens to be the antiparticle universe, into here. The energy flows naturally. When they block, they create crystallizations of energy. You can feel these sometimes with the fingertips. If you have nails, it's hard. I found that out because recently mine actually grew for the first time. And uh, I, was f I, I was feeling around in my leg and I could feel what felt like little tiny, tiny stones. They're little hard spots, little bumps. Feel around. Take your arm or your hand. Try to feel if you can feel them yet. Sometimes your fingertips have to get more sensitized and if you have long nails, it's hard to get your fingertip onto something because the nails get in the way. But try to find, explore your body for the feeling of little tiny round things. The kind of little tiny things, they feel like little shards of crystal that are in there. These are part of the miasmic imprint that you can actually feel. These are the parts that block the dyadic grid. When you massage those, if you can find them, and the more you play with this, the more your fingers will become sensitized to finding them very quickly in yourself and in other people. When you find them, you can do single point massage on them with a, quite a bit of pressure. And you can run energy. If you're, if you're working with the Cathara Biospiritual Healing System, you'll know how to turn on your energy currents in your palms and in your fingers. So you'll be able to directly really throw energy into them to break them up. If, you can, if you're having pain in a certain area of the body, guaranteed you will have a bunch of the dyadic vortices blocked with little miasmic crystals. You can use pinpoint massage in those areas. And even if you can't feel them yet, start with just using pinpoint massage, pushing with, take whatever finger feels, feels better, wherever you get the strongest pressure, and do circular. First do it clockwise and counterclockwise, or vice versa, just so you get it circulating in both areas, both directions. You will start to break up those frequency patterns, which will release that energy. It will let the natural flow of energy come back through the little dyadic vortices all over the body. Sometimes it takes some time to work them out. If you have a lot of pain in one area, you have a lot of congestion of miasmic buildup there. If you're aware, that pain comes from blocked something. You can find out at least what that something is and you can unblock it. You can have a lot of control over pain in your body. You can also have a lot of control of how much energy you're gonna let move into your body. So, I don't know, try it for a second. Take an arm, for example, you know, an arm. Most people aren't even in touch with their arms, they're just kind of there. You know, when's the last time you felt your arm, you know? Try to press hard in one little area, not to hurt yourself. But just start to circle. Try to sense if you can feel any little things that feel like little tiny, tiny pebbles or little shards of anything small. You may not feel it right away, but if you play with it long enough, you'll start to find them. You can start by finding them by pressing on your arm in several places and finding which one hurts. Because you'll start to find the pain and blocked dyadic vortices go together. You do have it. Like we do have these levels of our anatomy and it's just that we've been taught to not look there. We've not been taught anything about them so you don't know that they're there. You get pain and we, we get used to numbing our nervous system, literally shutting parts of it down so we don't feel how bad things really feel. And when you start to let energy run, you start to really feel what you've been blocking. Use the tools of running the vertical massages, just simple, you know, nice firm vertical massages for axiotonal lines, little circular pinpoint massages for the dyadic vortices. These are things that will become survival skills for you as we move into the time period of 2001 into 2017. If the place goes into pole shift, and this is something we never talked about, anybody that knows our work, we didn't start out as one of those doom and gloom people, oh, it's gonna be a pole shift. No, we didn't start out that at all. There's a lot of those out there. And we said, it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> but here's what needs to be done. We always had a very positive message. But to get to the point where I have been asked to bring the message to you, we even talk about pole shift. I know it's serious. 
I know that the conditions for the Guardian Alliance, which are the ones that I work with, which people who don't know the work, it, it's, you're probably better off uh, reading who they are. I can't, I'll, it'll take me two, two hours to explain to you who they are. But um, <laughs> for them to bring this up at this point, knowing how they teach, knowing they've never been alarmists, and they've never been saying, you have no power to do anything. For them to say, uh, look guys, um, <laughs> we have basically till the middle of 2002 to determine whether we're going to do plan A or plan B. Plan A is fix things here, plan B is evac anybody that can go out through a portal. If they're talking about evacs, my guys, the ones that have trained me who have never been alarmists, I know it's time to pay attention. That's why I'm sharing that message with you. I told them once upon a time, don't ever get like those like New Age channels and stuff that are talking about, you know, all the doom and gloom, because I won't do it. <laughs> you know, I won't teach that kind of stuff. And they understood that because they don't believe that stuff either. But they know that there are grid problems here. They know we're going through stuff. Now, one of the advantages of learning about your Antan Karana and learning how to help yourself with DNA activations is if it gets bad here. If it gets to the point where we can't fix it, an evac is necessary. They can't evacuate a whole planet of people. Where are you going to put them? There's not another planet in the density one field close enough that they could get us there still alive to put us on that would sustain human life. Humans can be evacuated through portals to several places. One of them is called Inner Earth, which is a different reality field that runs connected to our own, but it's its own time band. They have always, historically, when the place went into pole shift, taken who they could into inner earth, and then they resettled them back on surface when, it, you know, when the environment was stabilized again. There's inner earth. There's another place that we'll talk about. They're called the hidden cities. We'll talk about those on Sunday. This is something the Tibetans have known about for a very long time, but they don't have all the technicals on it. We've been given the technicals. This is how I know it's serious. This is information that was protected and held secret because there are so many humans on the planet right now that would abuse it, it's still not safe to bring it here. They wouldn't be releasing this if we didn't need to know now. Purpose of DNA activation for you is, if it gets bad, you need to have a minimum of a 4.5 strand DNA activation level to be able to go through a portal without spontaneous combustion happening to your body. This is part of the reason why they have stressed helping people to activate more quickly and comfortably and naturally, but why it's important to do it. Evacuations are not what we're focusing on. It's still plan A. Let's fix things here. And the advantage of DNA activation is you get yourself back. You get your memory back. You, find, you remember who you were, why you came here. You get your higher consciousness back. Now, as we're trying to make ourselves more comfortable in the process, there's one other thing we can do. We're talking about preparing the physical body. We have the running the axiotonal line massage. We have the dyadic massage. There are two points that we can massage also that will create a lot of help for the main vertical current to bring more energy in. It's a two-point massage. It doesn't take long. You can do it on yourself or you can have somebody you love do it. The cranial sacral seals. One is at the tailbone and the other is in the pineal gland. Now you can't exactly reach in and start massaging your pineal gland, but you can massage it through the crown. You could also right in here in the indent where the neck hooks on, the head and the neck hook together, there you can access the main energy circuits that run into the pineal from that spot and from this spot. And you can simply massage them for a while. You're sending, when you massage, you're sending a vibration. You're sending a movement of energy someplace. When you do it in specific points in the body, that energy movement will travel down, just like information travels down phone wires. It'll travel down the natural energy systems in the body to the place that those systems are connected to. So if you have connection things, energy conduits, between this point in your head and your pineal gland, and you rub here, you will send stimulation into the pineal. This will help the cranial sacral seals to release more easily. We call it the inner arc of the covenant. The arc of the covenant, one of my, my book Voyagers, The Secrets of Amente, explains about what the big arc of the covenant is. But the inner arc of the covenant Works the same way, but on a small level, just like it's a portal system, a natural organic portal system in our bodies that allows the frequency of the universal life force currents to build in the body. We are, when we're activating the pineal and releasing cranial sacral seals and activating DNA and doing all this stuff 
to get our Christed selves into our bodies. We are opening the inner Ark of the Covenant. And it's also an Ark of Light that reaches from the interdimensional spectrum down into our body, stimulates certain things into activation that have been dormant for thousands of years, and we become alive, more alive than what we're used to being when we're functioning on simply third strand activation. Now there's one more thing that I would like to do where it's like, uh, is that quarter after? I can't see the clock from here. My eyes are awful. It's quarter after. Okay. Hmm. All right. One thing that I do want to do, I, t I told him, yeah, well, all right, make a deal with you. There's something I want to do with you, okay? Because it's an experience that I think would be enjoyable. Can we all run out at 25 after to make sure we don't get in trouble because they want to lock the doors exactly at 9.30? If we can move quick, then I don't, I'm not going to cut it off here. He told me to cut it off at 9.15, but he knows me. We've gone hour, an hour over at times. So uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask uh, Michael, would you come up? I would like to run, please. I'd like to run the crystal exercise. And real quick, um, where's the crystals? we have them? Okay. Now, you don't have to read the introduction to it because it'll you know, save time not to. We're going to do an exercise that has to do with, and you can take this and play with it at home. I'm going to give you all a crystal, and you can keep it. They're not real expensive ones or big ones, but they're enough for the job. Crystals have the same type of template, light sound template, as the human DNA template. They are composed of the same frequencies of consciousness. So there's a natural co-resonance of vibration with quartz crystal and the human DNA. It will amplify your ability to sensitize and to bring in frequency. Now, there's an exercise that Michael's going to read for you. It was given to us two days ago. This is a new one. When we do our exercises, they're bioregenesis exercises, as we've said. We'll take you on a journey, but you're creating scalar wave patterns. When you're creating scalar wave patterns, you're influencing the DNA template in very specific ways. This particular exercise that involves moving your consciousness into a crystal, and it helps if you're holding one to do it, it will take you into a set of mathematical instructions that for, to you, to your conscious mind, looks like one set of things. You're doing a certain thing with your mind. Your body speaks the language of scalar waves and mathematical programming. Every one of the exercises that we use creates a mathematical program that is meant to begin the gentle activation of certain parts of the DNA. This particular exercise is meant to help you get your mental body up to a little bit higher level where it's not so stuck in the physical body programming and not quite so stuck in the resonance level of the planetary grids. So we're going to get your crystals really fast and Michael's going to read this one for you. This is just the beginning. I wish I had like four hours tonight because we could play and play and play. When we get into the workshops tomorrow, we're going to do some intensive things. Most people that have been to any of the workshops know we spend a good, sometimes an hour all told, doing like very long you know, exercises and kind of like going on you know, journeys and things like that. We'll have more time for that during the longer workshops. That's why we do the full three day. So in the meantime, okay, anybody doesn't have a crystal yet? Everybody got them? Okay. Now, this is just one technique, and the reason I'm doing it now, I could keep talking to you for the next 10 minutes, but I'd rather you just get to do something, get to put your mind someplace and take a little journey with us and realize it's a mathematical journey. Not to your conscious mind, it's more like images and watching things happen with your conscious mind, like a movie, but with your DNA template, you're sending it a mathematical program that's saying, open, open now, take me higher, take me higher, and this is what it's for. I don't think you need to read the first. Yeah, that's good. You don't have to read the first. Thank you, love. By the way, this wonderful person I'm so proud to introduce, this is Mr. Michael Dean, Reverend Michael Dean. He's from England. He just moved over here recently, and we were just married in October. And I'd just like to introduce my husband. I think he's the most wonderful person I've ever met. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, we don't have as much time to do this um, as we'd really like to do. But when we go home, <coughs> when we go home to Kinko's tonight, <laughs> I promise you that we will copy the procedure for everyone so that when you can, you can work with it at home and take the time you need to. The key thing for this uh, technique is to really, really get in touch with the, okay, right. is to really get in touch with the frequencies involved in the exercise, which are D10 and they're blue-black. 
and you need to spend a little while feeling those frequencies because it's through feeling the frequencies that you, you actually bring the transmissions into your fields that you're looking for. Sorry, I'm just practicing, Bill. <laughs> so, <clears throat> having said all that, we'll go. Um, would you like to bring the crystals up to your foreheads at the third eye position? In the little time that, that you have available, try and make a connection with the crystal. Try and feel it. Now imagine I'm saying this in the dark and I can't read a word. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, very good at, not very good at Braille, darling. <laughs> What do you want me to do? You know? Yeah, you know, I feel like Peter taught you. Right, Audrey, beloved. Now, sorry, sorry to interrupt you with my ridiculous humor. Um, okay, connect with the crystal. Imagine the crystal is actually moving from the position on your forehead. F just feel the crystal. Move to the inside, the position at the center of your head where the pineal is. Now I want you to visualize your pineal gland is inside the crystal, which you have now moved to the center of your head. Think of the pineal as a tiny multifaceted crystal ball. Shift to focus now, and in your mind's eye, imagine a small version of you, just as you are now, just as you're dressed, walking along a deep sapphire blue path. Now this path leads to your own crystal temple. It's a little way of head ahead of you, a little way ahead of your small self. Let's take a little time and try to sense your little self pulling the frequencies of the deep sapphire blue path into itself. Everything else around it is dark. Just imagine the frequency of this rich and vibrant color under the feet. Now what this small version of yourself is going to do, it's going to reach the pineal, the tiny multifaceted crystal inside the crystal temple. Keep walking along the path, do your best to feel the blue sapphire energies. You can notice the crystal temple just a little way ahead of you along the path if you wish, but concentrate on drawing the frequency from the sapphire light and watch as the little self approaches the temple entrance. Watch as it enters the temple and watch as it finds the tiny multifaceted crystal ball inside. This crystal ball radiates energy, which feels like a fuzzy outer shell. Watch as the hands of your little self explore this fuzzy barrier. And as it does this, transfer the sensation of the energy from your little self into your own physical feeling. Now we'll mimic what your little self has found, we'll copy it. You can bring your crystals away from your foreheads now. Bring the backs of your hands up towards your shoulders, palms facing me. Now from the position they're in, move your palms forward and backward just by a small amount and try and feel a layer of tension. Try and keep your consciousness on the little self as well, which is doing the same thing. As you practice this at home on your own, you will find as you pull more consciousness into your body by working with this technique, progressively you'll feel the barriers further away from you, which will be indicative of the level of consciousness that the exercise is producing in you. Now as you watch the little self, 
you notice that what it does is to draw its hands forward and you're going to do the same thing at the same time and to form a cup as if when you're in school you're trying to cut water in the palms of your hands you're going to copy your little self now and what you do is you see your little self raising the palms up and over the crown just wait and you hear the little self say I command now my book of knowledge <clears throat> when this is said with certainty and knowing a glowing crimson ball just seems to pop up in the center of the small self's hands you see this crimson ball pop up in the small self's hands now and you see it begin to spin it spins faster and faster until suddenly the crystal ball turns into silver liquid light held in the cup of the little self's hands the small self now continues to raise its cupped palms slowly and gently it pours the liquid light onto its own crown chakra you may copy this movement now imagine that you too are pouring the silver liquid light into your crown chakra when the little self has transferred all of the silver liquid into the crown chakra remove your physical hands also from your head and as you do this notice that the little self feels a flutter of energy as waves of silver light pass through its whole body just relax your hands now meanwhile the, crisp, the crimson ball which appeared earlier is nestled in the heart center make a connection with the crimson ball at your heart center and then bring your attention back to your whole body and try to feel a sensation of tiny sparks of liquid silver light flooding through your own cells and at the same time try to maintain your connection with the crim crimson ball while you feel the liquid light this crimson ball has the capacity to release locks on knowledge in a nursery capacity now inhale and on the exhale breathe silver energy into the ball making it expand repeat the inhale once or twice until you sense that the crimson ball has reached the size of a grapefruit return your attention to the little self and notice that it now opens and extends its right palm it is receiving a frequency key the frequency key looks like an ancient golden key please copy what the little self has just done open your right palm and hold it forwards try to feel the fuzzy presence an inch or so above your palm where the symbol key is now manifesting in the astral notice that the little self has now put its palms together it's transferring a mirror image of the symbol key into the left palm when you do this at home from time to time the color of the key will change though the key itself will remain the same the small self now opens the hands and puts the palms onto the force field surrounding the crystal which holds the pineal inside it transfers the symbols into the force field now bring the back of your physical hands back up to your shoulders in the position you used a few minutes ago feel the force field of the crystal inhale and on the exhale transfer the symbols into the field doing this will temporarily release resistance in the field and allow what is present to move through you the small body now removes its hands from the force field around the crystal and simply walks through it into the multifaceted pineal crystal at the center of the crystal temple 
try to sense or feel the swoosh as the little self enters and you follow discovering that the force field is easy to pass through as you move inside the temple you notice that it has grown huge in, this, in the center you notice a tiny gold and silver box it sits in a small pool of light surrounded by deep blue sapphire light this box holds the jewel you are seeking the little self knows the route to this box and you follow any path that the little self takes everything around you is delightful and everywhere is surrounded by deep blue sapphire light you move forward drawn by the knowing of the small self both of you together as if pulled by a magnetic beam the tiny silver gold box surrounded by deep blue sapphire light grows closer and closer the deep sapphire blue all around it is lush rich and alive you reach the small silver gold box and pick it up it feels warm and soft to your touch you open the box rays of multicolored light radiate out and you see the rays radiating from a small perfectly formed crystal the rays are the knowledge of self flowing up to you from the core template the small self picks up the crystal and puts it into its mouth copy this yourself feel the sensation of the tiny crystal on your tongue your small self swallows the crystal with no resistance at all and the crystal moves down to the solar plexus chakra seat of the 3D mind feel yourself swallow the crystal too and feel it move down to your own solar plexus this crystal holds all knowledge of your true self within and across all cycles feel the crystal in your upper stomach now it is a living entity it will stay with you until its information knowledge and consciousness is absorbed by your body when you have time and space to fully concentrate on the textures and the movements in this exercise you will only need to perform it once however you have several keys available to you each one takes six months to absorb working with a three to six day cycle we urge you not to use it more frequently during each, month, each, each six month cycle in meditation simply return to the crystal point in the stomach and the crystal will teach you the things you most need to know though this exercise can also enable you to open up very specific conduits of data you can leave your small self in the temple to learn more or you can bring it home whichever feels more comfortable this technique is also very useful as a walking exercise it teaches your mind to be aware of the living presence of the crystal at all times if you can sense its weight feel it as much as you possibly can as often as you can in your waking awareness the crystal provides much information pertinent to your state of focus at any given moment and will provide much support and guidance thank you okay well, they didn't kick us out yet. All right, we got to. We, we do have to leave, but he's, the the man is being nice at the counter. Um, when we have the longer workshops, there's more time to do things and to explain why they're done and what they can do for you. We start our workshops tomorrow at 10:30 for anybody who's interested, 
and we are going to explore some of the things I talked about. We're going to explore Atlantis and Lumeria and what the real divine blueprint was for this race. So if you're interested in coming, uh, between 10 and 1030 we'll be doing registrations and yeah, hope you, hope you come and I hope you is quite unique. There, some of the information has not been on planet for a very long time. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to sit down before I go, in, go into it here. Hmm? I feel like I'm in a corral. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to stand over here. <laughs> Alrighty. Anyway, good morning, almost. <laughs> okay. The information that I'm planning to cover in the next two days, first of all, I'd like you to know that it's all very new. It's been given in the last basically three week period. And it's information that will end up in the second edition of Voyager Secrets of Amente, but w that's why the book is held up and nobody can get it right now, because the publisher is waiting for me to put the new data in. This information is being given to us for a reason. If it hadn't been for the fact that there's some serious issues that we're being asked to help with, they would have waited to give this information. We're begin being given information that... <laughs> Some of it is so extensive that it would take probably about a four-day workshop to cover it. But what I can do is before the books come out, I can introduce you to some of it so you can begin working with it. You can begin using it to do something useful. One of the most important things that we're going to cover today is something called the Tribal Shield. Now, we'll go through a few other things before we get to exactly what the tribal shield is. But we all are part of one, we all have one in our DNA template. So it's part of your DNA template, and it has to do with something, something called fire letters, which are the core template programs that run the DNA template. The material on the tribal shields has been protected for many thousands of years, and it hasn't been allowed on planet because there's been too much corruption here, and people that have access to tribal shield information have access to opening the planetary grids. That can be very dangerous. That's why the information wasn't allowed here. But at this point, the grids are in real trouble because of what's happening with the Illuminati races. And if the information isn't given, there's not going to be anybody here that can try to fix it. So that's the reason we're being given this information. It has to do with planetary service. But at the same time, it's about personal service. The information on the tribal shields gives you the ability to wake up the core templates in the DNA, which will produce much more rapid activation of the 12-strand pattern. Or if you happen to be an indigo, it would be the 12-strand than the 24, 36, 48, whatever your indigo imprint is. It is the fa they are providing us with the fastest way to healthfully and naturally activate your DNA template. The DNA template is very important if you care about spiritual consciousness or if you care about growing and putting more of your consciousness in your body. Because when we come in to a fetal integration situation, we are large consciousness before we come into a baby body. What happens is we do fetal integration and the genetic code, because it's only operating on three strands, shuts out the rest of our memory. We can't fit the rest of our memory in the body we start to get more of our cells back when we start to activate DNA. So there's a real personal interest factor in learning about fire codes and learning about tribal shields. And there's also the planetary service aspect of it. Basically, when humans help to heal the planet, they also help to heal themselves and vice versa. So when we're exploring planetary issues, they apply to you too on a personal level that you can make changes in your personal lives with. Before we go into the mechanics of the tribal shield and what it does. There's some other questions that it's very important for us if we're going to learn about tribal shields and the things that give us that gives us the power to do. There's a little bit of history that we need to understand about who the heck are we anyway? <laughs> what is this race called the angelic human race? Where do we come from? Most of us can't remember because the DNA is blocking it out. There are answers to that. And unfortunately, you're not going to find them in most history books here because there has been a campaign that's being waged since 25,500 B.C., an intentional, calculated, strategic plan to eradicate the race memory here. So certain factions could come in 
we call them visitors in the contemporary time, they call them ETs, well, they used to call them fallen angelics. They want to be able to come in here and say, oh, hi, we created you, you were apes, we created you from apes, you should be thankful to us, follow us. We have been set up. It has been a long-term infiltration program, and it's been working really, really well. There was a deadline to this program, and that was the stellar activation cycle of the year 2000 to 2017 AD. They have known that this was going to be a stellar activation cycle for thousands of years. The they that I'm talking about are angelic visitors, fallen angelic visitors, but it was also who we used to be in earlier time frames. There was a system of time calculation that was built upon cycles, understanding the planetary cycles, understanding how time is simultaneous, yet can be perceived in linear fashion because of the cycles. It's like going on a train track and you can see one set of scenery. That's what time is like, but there's lots of train tracks running at the same time. We all once upon a time knew this time system. And when you know the time system of the cycles, you know that certain things reoccur repeatedly at very specific intervals of time. The reason we don't know anymore is because that information was purposely taken from us. So when it came time for the long-anticipated stellar activation cycle, we wouldn't know who we were, what we were supposed to do. We wouldn't even believe it was real because somebody was very interested in making sure we didn't do something that would inhibit their plans. That implies that we must have a hidden power and a hidden purpose that somebody would go to that much trouble to eradicate our race memory and try to hijack our own self-identity. So we just didn't even know that we were supposed to do something in this period of time. If we go back a little bit into history, into our history as a human race, we're going to find some interesting things. We're going to find our purpose, not just as individuals, but as individuals as part of a collective. This race was created for a purpose, and it was divine purpose. We were here, we were sent here on a sacred mission. We weren't here because we were bad and we fell and got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. That's an Anunnaki part of the story. See, they took our stories, our true stories of our spirituality, of what we knew about other space-time places. They took our relationship with God and they perverted it by putting other pieces of stories in there that weren't true. And we've been fed those stories for thousands of years. And we knew because we could feel that there was a part of truth in them because it resonates and your heart opens. You can pick up any holy book and somewhere in there you're going to find some stuff that really fits. Yes, this must be a good book. What we didn't realize is part of the books were edited and sometimes you'd have about 80% good stuff and 20% stuff that made it all mean something different. If we go back and look at our history, we will find what we were created to do. And what is really amazing, when this was shown to me recently, I saw in the most beautiful, eloquent design. Humans were put here by design. And it was a design that was choreographed into different time cycles at the same time. As we move through this presentation, we're going to talk about something called the cycle of the rounds. The cycle of the rounds was the divine blueprint for the human evolutionary pattern. There were four rounds of evolutionary cycles on planet Earth. And through those four rounds, we were supposed to accomplish something. For ourselves, we'd get to experience the time down here, but we were supposed to accomplish something for the planet. When the mechanics of some of this were sh was shown to me, I was just amazed at the intricacy of the design. Somebody up there is a creator. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this doesn't happen by accident. Big bangs don't create this. <laughs> Each one of us right now, even though we forgot, even though we've, been, we've had our identity and our history hidden from us, right now we are part of something called the cycle of the rounds. And there are other parts of our race that are, intent, that are planning to do certain things to help this planet in their time frames. They're depending on us to do ours. When we look at our race as it is right now on the planet, it's kind of lost. Everybody's fighting with each other. You know, there's just problems all over the place. 
There's no peace anymore. There's no harmony anymore. There's pseudo peace that's filled with tension. There's people worn out from working jobs they don't like. There, you know, there's people starving in parts of the country. Other people having like mansions all over the place. Really imbalance of stuff here. While we're so preoccupied with all this stuff, there are in other time vectors that are connected to this parts of this race that are waiting for us to do something. Because if we don't do our part, their parts aren't going to work either. So we're going to get into that. And in this, the personal significance in finding this information is realizing every one of you count. And you were counted when you came here. Just because you don't get that recognition out here in the way society is structured, you were created as a frequency carrier. And without that frequency, a part of the pattern falls apart. Each one of us is part of a divine pattern that was put here to do something that we'll get into what that something is. It's a very specific mission we were sent on. So here, we'll get into it. First, we'll talk about the Maji Grail line, the angelic human heritage. The word Maji has several meanings. It basically comes out of an affiliation with a race called the Maharaji. The Maharaji are a density two race, which means from dimension four, five, six. They are human. They are an advanced human. They are the original genetic code from which the uh, contemporary indigo children come from. So they would have 24 to 48 strand DNA templates. They're blue. They're blue humans. They look a lot like us, but they're taller. They don't have much hair, but they are quite human. And they are a strain of humans that were created out of the same core seed race that we were created out of. They were created on Terra, just like we were. And they were seeded into Cirrus B, where we were seeded into Earth and into Tara and Gaia. The Maharaji have served as guardians for us. They're not the only ones, but in Density 2, they're the ones that have looked over us and tried to help us. They have literally come in here with spaceships and waged war with ones who were trying to stomp out our race. Some of that's recorded in the Mahabharata, which is a, a Sanskrit text that talks about certain wars when they came in with the ships, the flying ships. The blue people, there's a, some of the blue people aren't the Maharaji. Some of them are other strains that have mixed with negative factions of ETs or fallen angelics. They're involved with actually the Montauk Project, and they were involved with the Thule Society and the Nazi movement. These are not the same blue people. When I talk about the Maharaji, these are beings that have really one purpose for staying in manifestation, because it brings them joy to help, because they care. It's a way of their expressing love. So they've stuck around a lot. Now, Maji race lines are the human, the earth human version of the Maharaji. It's another name for an indigo child. Angelic humans come in several forms, and they're all just as blessed and just as important. The minimum uh, strand, DNA strand template that an angelic human has is 12, 12 strand template. The Maharaji go, from, really, from 13 up to 48, and anywhere in there. It wasn't, when, when the human races were created and seeded here, the differences in the gene codes weren't created to put somebody in charge over somebody smaller. The reason there were differences in the gene codes is because the whole group of us, as equal beings before entering manifestation, knew that the planetary grids could not sustain a full race that had 48 strand DNA templates. They needed certain amounts of 48 strand DNA templates to run certain frequencies here. But the grids couldn't hold a whole race that way. So some of us agreed to have the larger templates and you got larger responsibility with it. And some of us agreed to take the smaller ones. But when these agreements were made, we were all equal and we knew it. Nobody looked down and you know, looked, was angry because you have more than I do and nobody looked down at the other because, ha, I have more DNA than you. It wasn't like that. We were created as a team, and we worked as a team for a long time until we were taught not to. Now, the Maharaji and the Maji lines, this is the true genetic ascendancy of this race. What we have been programmed for many thousands of years now to believe is that we somehow have an affiliation with apes. We somehow came out of apes. This is not true. Tomorrow, we're going to get into exactly where that came from, because it came from the Anunnaki because they're the ones 
that came out of apes. And they have been trying to make it look like we are a product of their genetic experimentation here. And that is not true. So we'll get into that a little bit tomorrow. But one thing we need to understand, all the things that you've learned about what it means to be human, all the things that you've been told from churches and religious systems that say you're a sinful race, you're bad, God's mad at you, you got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> you know, uh-uh. These have been fed to us to make us lesser than what we are. Because it was known that we are creators. And what we think, we will manifest. Those who were messing with us knew that. So what did they get us to think? You're lowly, sinful, pathetic creatures. A step up from animals. Because if we believed it enough, we'd start acting that way. We've been tricked into using our own minds against ourselves. So one of the things, when we start exploring what is our potential, what are we here to do, and how can I make my own life better, you need to have enough freedom of mind to say, you know, there's so much garbage that's been dumped here as far as ideas in the last 25,000 years. Might as well start over. Let's try some new ones. You know, you don't have to be attached to them. But a lot of people get very attached to old ideas and old belief systems. Rather than saying, well, I'll take what's good there and what works and what's moving me into greater evolution, they're afraid to let go of the parts that are holding them back. You probably wouldn't be here if you fit into that category. <laughs> Most people that listen to this work at all are not people who are stuck totally in the past where they're going to hold on to a doctrine or just one book. They want to know more. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're the type of people who want to know more because there's a ton of stuff to know. Okay. I just wanted to let you know that with the ascendancy, we didn't just come from Tara. Everything comes into manifestation from non-manifestation, non which means we come from source or God into the primal sound fields, into the primal light fields. Then we start to enter density, like we talked about last night, through the D12 Christos template, which is at dimension 12, it's pre-matter, hydroplasm, liquid light. Then we move down into form. We literally have a genetic ancestry that goes all the way up to the primal light fields. We are part of a family line. And what's happening on our planet right now, particularly if you're paying attention to the channels in the New Age movement, everybody's talking to Anunnaki's these days. Palladians, by the way, happen to be Anunnaki. You ever see that on the websites? All the material that's coming out of channels, the Palladians. Oh, you know, we created you, you know, we're your space brothers and kind of space parents. And this. They are trying to make sure we don't remember our ascendancy, because if we do, we'll remember how to activate our DNA. It helps to know that, first of all, there are a group of beings called the Brenau. The Brenau are in density five. They, they exist as wave form. Density five is dimensions 15, 14, and 13. That's the, pre, the primal light fields, the Kirache light fields. So they exist as living conscious light, as gestalts of light, conscious light. Every one of us, to get here, had to come through one of those, which means we have a part of our consciousness there as part of a Brenau. They also call them Rishi, Brenau Rishi. Now, the Brenau are called the founders because they are the ones that seeded life into this time matrix. 950 billion years ago was the last time a life wave was seeded here. It wasn't when this time matrix was created, but if we're going to calculate in terms of linear time, it would be 950 billion years ago that the last life wave or the last wave of consciousness came from source to seed life in its time matrix. The Brenau are the founders in that they were the consciousness collectives that came in to the primal light fields and said, all right, we're gifted with the ability to create. What shall we create? What type of life form shall we create? There's a part of us that was a part of these collectives and made these decisions. For creating life forms wasn't simply to create something to play with. It was what are we going to create ourselves as? Because just like God, source, manifests itself, it is one quantity of energy, decides to experience manifestation, and it breaks itself down into various forms to experience what that means. The Brenau did the same. We are part of the product of that. So are the other life forms in this time matrix. So our genetic ascendancy comes from the Brenau founders in density five in the primal light fields. 
The next step down, if we're going to trace what's in our DNA template, now this is where you start to get differentiation. Other races went different ways, like Anunnaki are created in a completely different chain of genetic order. And it started from here, from density four, which is dimensions 12, 11, and 10. They're the hydroplasmic liquid light fields, where you can actually take on form if you choose, but it's kind of like, what was it, the old Terminator movie where they had the silver guy who could melt himself down into a puddle and then turn himself back up? It's kind of like that. It's kind of, it's a form where you can take on form just by the thought. You can take on whatever form you desire by thinking that form. And your matter substance, which is pre-matter, will conform to that thought. There's a part of a station there right now. That's our Christos level self. There are Christos founders races that are in density four. And there are many different types of them. The type that we came out of are called the Anahazi. That's not Anunnaki. Anunnaki were created as the Avengers of Anu. They were created to destroy the Anahazi and their races. They were created as a reaction to our creation, not as an action unto itself. Doesn't mean they're evil. It means they got some problems, and they like to make them ours. But Anahazi are Elohai Elohim. There, you hear the word Elohim a lot out there in different spiritual teachings. What most people don't realize is there are different families of Elohim. You have Elohai Elohim who have retained their ascension codes. They've retained their connection to their Brenau families and to the Ascended Master Collectives beyond the time matrix. There are Anu Elohim who severed their connection and they're literally running what is called an Antichristos DNA template. It means they're running their fire letters or the sequences of frequency in their DNA in reverse so they do not have to connect to the higher light fields so they don't have to cooperate they can go on their little dominion agendas and do whatever they want if they were functioning right if they weren't distorted in their consciousness because their dna was distorted they wouldn't do those things anyway because beings who are christed who keep their connection to the higher levels of identity it doesn't come natural for them to cause harm to other life because they know they're part of the one and they know all things are a fa part of the face of God. So there's a love that happens. But when a being has distortion in their manifestation template, which can happen kind of by accident, it's called code convolution. If you, it's kind of like inbreeding here. If you have a small family that keeps having children together, you start getting mutations in the DNA templates that weren't expected or desired. That happened when the founders in density five and density four were creating new life fields. They had a limited selection for a while with, with their own life fields, and some of them had code convolution, which is like inbreeding. This is where the fallen races came from. And they were never hated or considered evil, but their actions had to be stopped because they were destroying other things in this time matrix. <coughs> now, <coughs> we were not a fallen race. <laughs> the story about the original sin, I'm not gonna go into that right now because that would take too long for today but it will be in the Voyager's uh, Volume 2 uh, update, the second printing of that. You're going to be surprised at where that came from. It started way before humans were even created. So there is a story about an original sin. And the simple sin was that what was done created mutations in the DNA templates of everything in this time matrix. Because somebody blew up a Stargate on purpose. The original sin was blowing up Stargate 12, which was the density for a Stargate. If that Stargate does not work, everything below it is stuck in the time matrix, and it can't ascend, and it can't get back out. That gate has been repaired since then. That was 250 billion years ago when that happened. That was before humans were created. But anyway, this is our lineup. Brenna founders races, Christos races, Anahazi Elohai Elohim. What the Elohai Elohim look like are liquid light feline hominids. They are the cat people that some people are channeling. They're the felines. And they, they look hominid. They look kind of like human, but they have large, you know, almond-shaped eyes. And they're, very, they're quite pretty. Some of them actually have kitty-type faces. There really are kitty beings out there. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's like really weird when you start to realize not everything looks like we do here. <laughs> you know? They really do look different, some of them. But that's okay, and some of them that look different were actually created first, so we probably look stranger to them than they do to us. So we came out of the Anahazi. Then when we came down, 
The next st stage, after our gene code evolved into the Anahazi Elahai Elohim, there was another level made where we could enter densities <coughs> one through four, not just up in the higher densities where you're made out of pre-matter, but we go all the way down in the densities and experience physical matter and uh, semi-etheric and etheric matter. This race was called the Azurites. They had 48 strand templates, which is the highest you can have in, the, the, in this time matrix to actually activate a 48 strand template. Now, the Azurites are blue people too. They were actually the first blue people. And they were a combination that was a co-evolution agreement between three different families of the Brennau founders that put their codes together and created kind of like a super race. They created it for a reason, to serve as guardians in this time matrix. They created it after the destruction of Stargate 12 because somebody had to be put on security patrol here before the fallen angelics totally ripped the whole time matrix apart. So the Azurites were created as the Azurite Universal Security Team. This is the lineage out of which humans came as we came down the chain. Now, the Azurites were placed in dimensions, uh, densities, one through four, in all the locations near the 12 primary stargates. So they were basically the security team. They're still around too. They're some of the ones visiting here. So you have the Maharaji blue people from Cirrus B that have more human in them, and then you have the Azurites that were actually, that's where the Maharaji came out of. That's where they got their blue coloring from. So we came down through the Azurites. Then there's a race called the Oraphim. This is our official host race, the seed race that we came out of. The Oraphim was a DNA template that was made by combining the Azurites, again, with the Anahazi. So strengthening the Lyran codes, because the Lyran, these are Lyran races, the Anahazi Elohai Elohim, they're from the Lyra star system, if you were going to look at it in terms of the star systems, but they're in density four. So this and this were combined again to create this, Oraphim. The word Oraphim meant sons of light. And it didn't mean sons, S-O-Ns, they're boys. It meant sons because they radiated light like suns, S-U-N. So it wasn't a gender biased sons of light. The Oraphim had 24 to 48 strand DNA templates. These were the races that were seated on Gaia and Tara, where we came from. They broke their DNA templates down a bit so they could downstep into the lower densities. And first they created what's called the Turinicium, angelic human 12 strand. So out of the 24 to 48 strands, they reduced it a bit into a 12 strand. DNA template, which allowed them to go a little bit deeper into the densities in density two. From the Turinicium, which were created on Tara in density two, Earth's counterpart in density two, this is where the 12 tribes, angelic humans that were seated on Earth, came from. This is our ancestry. People run around trying to figure out who their, you know, what their genealogy is, you know, what family they might have come out of here, but we never stop to think, where'd the whole bunch of us come out of? Because this is what's important. Because we find out what, where we came from, we might find out why we came and how to get back where it is we came from. Okay? So we came down this chain of ancestry. We carry the DNA template coding of these races within our templates right now. We can put the next one on, please. Thank you. Let me see if I need the next one. Okay. Now, the last one we left off on talking about was the Turinicium. The Turinicium of Tara, in, for people who have read Voyager's Volume 2, Secrets of Amente, even the original version of it, we talk about the Turinicium and how that race was, was seated here because there was a cataclysm on Tara. That's where the 12 tribes came from. In Amente, in that book, you will also find that there were two other seedings. The first one was 250 million years ago on this planet, and it was wiped out by fallen angelic infiltration and a war called the Electric Wars that decimated all of the races, and it, had to, and it was restart, they had to do it again. Seeding two was put in here about three million years ago. And by 846,000 BC, that was flattened. Guess who again? <laughs> and when I talk about fallen angelics, basically two of our stellar kin, draconian races and Anunnaki races. We are seeding three. We are part of seeding three of the angelic human 12 tribes, Tornisium. Seeding three, it's very interesting, because this is where we get closer. Where did we come from? Okay, let's just deal with our immediate seeding. Because we know there's all these races on the planet. 
We know that our history tells us there were some guys back there that were called Neanderthal, there were some guys back there called Cro-Magnon, all sorts of different things. Like, what do they have to do with us? Who knows? Even the scientists aren't quite sure. <laughs> if we look at where the evolution that got us to this point right here came from, we start to realize that all the races on the planet right now came out of this original seeding. All of the angelic human races came out of the seeding three, Seeding 3 began in 798,000 B.C. That's when it was officially started, after Seeding 2 had been flattened earlier. Seeding 3 began with a race called the, Pal the Palladia Urtite Cloister Magi Grail Lines. The Palladia Urtite Cloister Races. Now the Urtite race was a race, a host race, that was created out of two strains of angelic humans from seeding two that had gone into exile on, in the Pleiades in density two when everything was getting blown up down here. They had come back, the remnants of that race had come back because they'd been commissioned to begin, you know, to start seeding three. And they found a few survivors of some of the root races that were here from seeding two that had been, they'd actually gone into inner earth and they came back out. So there was, they combined their gene codes and they created a race line called the Urtites that would serve as the host race. It would have all the necessary DNA template coatings that would go with the planetary grids, which we'll get into later. <laughs> In that time period, they were breatharians. They didn't, these were the ones I was talking a little bit about yesterday. They did not need to eat. They didn't even need to drink because they could directly interface with the energy in the atmosphere and bring enough energy in to self-sustain. They had immortal bodies. They could keep them as li alive as long as they wanted to. They didn't get sick. They didn't have to. There was something that happened, and this is a story that's told in the new material in the Voyager's book, too, that would take us too far off track to get into it, but it's called the Fall of Brenoway, when the planetary grids got so damaged that the Palladia races couldn't live here anymore because they couldn't pull enough frequency to the, through the planetary grids, and they needed to be someplace where there was free-flowing energy because without it, they would die because they couldn't pull it in like they're supposed to, and they didn't have the same digestive apparatus that we have. So the Palladia races started our seeding. They didn't die out. They moved because they had to. Now, they started in 798,000 B.C. They were on planet until 208,216 B.C., which was the last stellar activation cycle when everything went bad and the grids got really damaged. So the Palladia races were interesting. They seeded 144,000 of them. There were 12 tribes of 12,000 each. But the 12 tribes were seated in 24 different places. This is one really neat thing, that you can actually begin to find out what tribe of the 12 tribes you were part of. Because every time, no matter how many times they had to be reseeded or resettled, the 12 tribes were seated in exactly the same locations. Because the 12 tribes had DNA template coding that was keyed to the stargates. There are 12 primary stargates on the planet. And each of the 12 tribes carried the set of what's called fire letter or flame codes in the core DNA template that corresponded to the planetary grids that would allow them to hold and process the frequencies of a specific, one of the specific 12 stargates. So they were always seated in locations of the stargates to which their DNA template was, was calibrated. Now, for each stargate, there are 12. There's also an activation site that's even more important than the stargate itself because it leads to the inner Earth stargates. So our activation points for our stargates that are located elsewhere are actually right over inner Earth stargates. Now, the races, the 12 tribes races, were put here as a guardian race. They were the security team for the Templar. And they lived by, I believe they're here about, they say, about 10,000 years before again they were getting invaded all over the place. We have had a history of war here for literally millions of years because there are races that want the Halls of Amente Stargates. And our race was commissioned as the guardians of the Halls of Amente Stargates. So we were the targets because we were in the way. Now the Palladia races, we carry the coding in our DNA template that go with the Palladia races. These were the five Palladia races. There were three that are called Urtite Tricloister races, which now, in contemporary times, they are the indigo type ones. 
that are coming in, the indigo children, type ones. There's three types, they're type ones. They were the Mua race, the Murahavia were actually how you, I mean, it's hard to pronounce, so they just call them the Mua. They had 43 to 48 strand DNA templates. These were the Maji lines, and the rest of the angelic human lines came out of them. So we all have a bit of that coding. So we had the Mua, the U, Ur type cloister race, they had 37 to 42 strand DNA templates, and the Ur, Ur type, they're actually the Urta, but they just call them the Ur, Ur type cloister race. Each one of these were called keepers of the flame because they each held within their DNA template one of the three primary sets of fire letters that went with the three primal Kirishay light fields. The blue light field, which is called the Akkadic light field. That is the closest one to source. It's the final expansion into source. That would be the blue light ray that the others come out of. So the Mua were the keepers of the blue flame Akkadic codes. They held within their DNA template the ability to run the whole light sound frequencies from the 15-dimensional spectrum and from beyond into the, the uh, Kundare primal sound fields. The U race had 37 to 42 strands. They were the gold flame keepers, which are called the polaric codes. These words, the catic, polaric, and triadic, refer to the three levels of what's called the energy matrix that exists beyond the 15-dimensional time matrix. You can look at it simply as if, let's say you have source here. This is source energy. This is God. Then you have three levels of individuation that God goes through and creates reality fields. These are the primal sound fields. First you have the akkadic. That's the first level of individuation. Then you have the polaric. Then you have the triadic. And then you have the time matrix where you get into the three primal light fields and everything inside of the pr primal light fields. So the akkadic level represents first expansion. Your, your la if you're going up it would be your last expansion point into source. It's the closest to source. This one would be the next closest to source. And this one would be the third closest to source. When we talk about codes, they are frequency patterns. They are fire letters that correspond to those frequencies in the primal light fields. So these three primary races were considered the keepers of those codes. And they were the ones that would anchor those frequencies into the planetary grids. They had the commission to do that. And later we'll get into why they had to, had to do that. Somebody had to do that because it gets into what our mission was, why we were sent here. Now, the three, these three races came in at the same time, 798,000 BC. These came in with them. These were called bi-cloister races. There was the Brenoa, Urtek cloister, which was the Mua and the Yu put together. So it had part of the coating of each of those. They were keepers of the blue-gold flame. They didn't have all of the blue or all of the gold. They had part of each. They had their own Stargate assignments. They had part of the Akkadic Polaric Codes, and they had 28 to 30 strands. So as you notice, they're breaking the strand count down, where these are the ones that could run big frequency. These could run a little bit less, a little bit less. And by the time we got down to the root races, way down into the, like, the later cycles, they could run just little bits of frequency. But every little bit of frequency was needed and important in the time frame that it was placed. So it wasn't a superiority complex thing. It was a cooperation thing. In the ancient days, the races that had smaller DNA templates loved the races, the Maji races, because the Maji held for them the knowledge that they couldn't hold in their own body. And the Maji loved them and would treat them very well. They were never mistreated. There was a love that went between them. So these are the basic five races. We have Rama. Here's the last ones that came out of the five uh, Palladia or Tech cloisters. The Rama races. That was the U race plus the Ur race. They are keepers of the gold violet flame. They had 24, sometimes 25, to 27 DNA strand templates. These still qualify. These would be indigo type 2 in contemporary terms. These would be indigo type 1s. They're coming back on the planet now because we're in a stellar activation cycle. That's why for the last 100 years, slowly, the indigo children that you hear about in the New Age movement, they have been coming in. This is who they are. They're the consciousness that was there. But as we go along, we're going to learn something really cool about the fact that they're not as much strangers as we think they are. <laughs> okay, we go on to the next slide. <coughs> this is where it starts to get fun. The cycle of the rounds, the evolutionary divine blueprint of this race, of the Palladia races. Seeding three, we had the five Palladia races came in. But it was part of a bigger pattern. 
The seeding three twelve tribes, they were seated on earth in four different interconnected time cycles, each one with a set of different types of DNA templates. They were all seated at the same time. Now if we remember what we talked about a little bit yesterday, time is simultaneous. That means they're there in their time vector right now. We're here in our time vector. They're interconnected. We are a part of this, and they are a part of what we're doing in our society now. Now, the evolutionary cycle of the rounds, it was the secret of the rounds that has been, been hidden here for thousands and thousands of years. Because what the rounds were, were understanding how the planetary grids worked, how the stargates worked, and how the DNA worked with them, and how beings could interlink across time bands to bring in frequency to create a certain effect. The effect was called the planetary Christos realignment. It was a mission about anchoring in the planetary grids the planet's own D12 Christos template that had been damaged in the fall from Tara. Now that fall from Tara is talked about in the Secrets of Amente book that will be out soon for anybody who hasn't seen it, but I don't like to go over stuff for, because we, a lot of people are familiar with that already and I want to bore you to death. But anyway, the planetary grids were damaged. This is where we get into our mission. This cycle of the rounds evolutionary blueprint wasn't a haphazard, let's throw some people down there and see what they do. We agreed to come in on a commission that would help restore the natural alignment of the fire letter sequences in Earth's planetary grids, just like DNA templates, manifestation templates, are built on fire letters, which are consolidated points of frequency. They're little frequency areas that hold very specific combinations of frequency into alignment, which creates the basic pattern upon which matter can manifest. Everything has fire letter sequences. Every biological form, every matter form, if you would look at it from a higher dimensional level, you would see it as an energy form. And if you looked into what structures are in that energy form, you would find little symbol codes. They look like symbols to your mind. What they are is mathematical encodings that are telling the wave bands, the frequency wave bands, how to cross through each other and how to interact with each other. They're controlling the rates of vibration and oscillation in energy <coughs> patterns. So fire letters are the key element that forms the structure of matter. The planetary grids are composed of fire letters. There is a certain sequence of fire letters, 12 dimensional levels of fire letters, that the planet's supposed to function on when it's in alignment with its Christos template. If a planet comes out of alignment with its Christos template, what that means is it can't process the frequencies from the higher dimensional fields anymore. If it gets cut off, if the grids can't process more than uh, D9 fire letters, you won't be able to get more than ninth dimensional frequency in there. That means you won't be able to have a Christ of being walking on the planet, because a Christ of being is a 12 dimensional being. When a planet gets in that condition, it's called being cut off from the grid. And unless it is reattached to its primal life force currents, it will become a finite planet, and so will the life fields on it. Because it won't be able to receive the light fields coming down from the Kirache primal light fields. It won't be able to receive the sound frequencies coming down from the primal sound fields. These are the currents of perpetual consciousness that circulate through the time matrix all the time. But if a being or a planet can't pull those currents in anymore because there's a blockage in its own template, it progressively starts to lose energy because it can't have the natural flow anymore. When this happens on a planetary level, eventually, and it takes billions of years for it to happen, but eventually the planet feeds on itself where it begins to grow more dense and more dense and more dense and eventually it implodes and it becomes a black hole. And every time a black hole like that is made in the, in the universal structure, it takes energy and throws it someplace else. That means the whole universal structure is affected to the point where it has a blockage now. It's not just the planet that's blocked. It's what used to be the planet that's not there anymore is now a hole that energy falls through. So it can cause a major problem if you have a time matrix with four universes in it and you have a whole bunch of planets turning into black holes. You're going to lose the energy out of that universe. It's going to go someplace else in a disharmonic, chaotic form and you're going to lose the life field in the time matrix. It will not be able to sustain life anymore. So when a planet gets in trouble like that, there are the guardian races, the Brenau from Density 5, and a group called the Ascend, uh, they call them Ascended Masters, but that term is horribly abused in the New Age movement. 
So I prefer the, their term that they call themselves, which is Yanis. And it means of the unisai, really. And the unisai is the word they use for the central point, the one consciousness. That's their word for God. It doesn't matter what you call God. But they call themselves the Yanis. They are beings that are stations of consciousness that never come into manifestation. They sustain the primal sound fields. And the primal sound fields are consciousness. And it is the consciousness of the Yanis that gives the primal sound fields consciousness. So they are like the first expressions of source. And they are like cosmic consciousness. When a time matrix or a planetary system gets in trouble, to the point where it's going to be jeopardizing other systems as well, there are teams sent in on the repair work. There are teams sent in to put it back to its natural primal order so the perpetual life cycle can continue. The human race was created as one of those teams. In fact, we were created to replace the original team, the Azerites that were created. They were, the Azerites were created 250 billion years ago, and they got very tired. They were the same ascended masters coming into manifestation, serving as the galactic police. You know, <laughs> they got really tired with it. And they decided, let's have a new life wave come in of ones who ascended masters who want to come into flesh, and we'll take over, and we'll create a race form that will have even more advantages as far as the frequencies it can hold and the, and the uh, planetary systems it can go into. This is where humans, the decision bless you, to make humans was created. That's where we ended up with crossing the Azerites with the uh, Anahazi to make the Orophim, to get the Turanissim out of them, to get us. So we were created with a very sacred mission. Had to do with this planet, but also had to do with guarding the universal stargates, the 12 dimensions of the universal stargates. Okay, now... Back to the evolutionary rounds, because you're going to hear this a lot, the cycle of the rounds. And when I, when I say that, I hope it'll like jump in your mind, oh yeah, that's the evolutionary blueprint, the race evolutionary blueprint, because that's really all it is. It's not some big mysterious thing. But the cycle of the rounds are fascinating, because it's an intertime connection that we have with three other rounds of evolution. They're aware of us. We're not aware of them yet. But we're in a stellar activation cycle when the timelines cross over each other and the timelines blend. This is when we can open to each other. And there may be a time, if things don't get rough here, when we'll actually be able to meet some of them. The funniest part is, <laughs> we'll be meeting ourselves. You know how I hear about reincarnation? <laughs> well, it puts a whole new twist on it if you take that and the concept of simultaneous time all in the same boat. That means, wait a minute, I'm born and I die, but then I don't come back? No, it means you're born in several different places at once. And there is the possibility of, if those time vectors come together, you could actually meet yourself. And you would be looking at yourself, and you would look different than you do here. But you would be able to recognize, oh, that's us. Yeah, that's us. We may have the opportunity to do that if things go well. We may be able to meet some of the races, some of the Palladia races, they were seated here in 798,000 BC because their time vector is still there. Time is a very interesting thing. It appears to move backwards and forwards, but it doesn't. It really just sits still. It's our consciousness that moves through it. The patterns of identity that are in imbued in time are eternal. While we are here, our other selves will be here too. It gets a little tricky to try to even conceptualize it in a linear frame. That's why when I, when I try to teach people a little bit about time, about how to get out of the linear focus, it helps to try things like astral projection. Because, or try to remember dreams when you find yourself in this kind of strange time space where it's larger, you just feel like your, your um, awareness is expanded, and time works a little different. Like you might find yourself dreaming four dreams all at the same time and standing back and going, yeah, I'm doing this, aren't I? You know? <laughs> this is more of the real nature of time. Now, I'm not going to get into a heavy thing on time right now because it will just be confusing, and it will take us out of where I want to go with this. Because what I want to do, before we have to leave tonight, I want to take you through some fascinating information that has to do with the 12 tribes. I want to expose a little trickery that's been done to this race and why it's been done. And I want to give what they gave me I spent all night last night um, doing because they finally gave it to me. These names, there are names, 12 names of 12 tribes that were the original names. The names are very important, and I won't tell you why yet, but we'll get to that. 
the importance has to do with sound and what sound does to DNA. And we'll come back to this now, and we'll get back to the tribal shield, because that's where, that, where that's going. The evolutionary rounds, we are round four. We are part of what is round four. Now, oh, by the way, these things, you don't have to read them all. If you are interested in this, we'll have them as a chart pack by tomorrow, but it's because it was just, you know, given to us last night. We hadn't have time. It would have been three more hours late if I waited at Kinko's. So this is available if you want it. Can I see the other one? This, God bless my husband, because... <laughs> he, he pasted this up for, for me yesterday. And this one. I'm sure to use that. <laughs> that was a lot of work. <laughs> and I, it wouldn't be here if he hadn't helped. <laughs> okay. This. The cycle of the rounds for seeding three. Remember, we're seeding three because the other two got wiped out. Now, over here. Let me straighten that out just a little. Making me dizzy. Looking at it there. <laughs> a little straight I know. Okay. Now, we have round one. We talked about a little bit. The five Palladia Urtite Cloisterases. Their cycle ran from 798,000 B.C. to 208,216 B.C. Now, if you follow the linear track of time, something did happen to them, except the place before it happened, they're still there. That's where we're going to be able to intersect with them. Now, what happened to the Palladia races in their linear vector? was there was an attack made by draconian races during a stellar activation cycle. And they came in to try to raid the stargates. And they partially got control of the grids. And these races were not wiped out, but they were taken off planet in EVAC. So were most other things, because the guardian races were going to come in to try to secure the stargates. And they knew it was going to make it roll if they tried to shut the stargates. But if they didn't, the draconian forces were going to raid all the way up the density levels and get control of the time matrix. So the Pleiadia races had a little problem. Once the dust had settled here, they could no longer live on the planet because you need a planet to be a, a breatharian, full breatharian. You have to be on a planet that can run the D12 frequency, which is the Maharada current, because that's what sustained them. They could bring in enough frequency, the pre-matter liquid light, that it sustained their bodies. The grids got closed down to what's called a 10-code pulse. Now, the Maharada, when it runs through the grids, that would be called a 12-code pulse, a 12-dimensional frequency being able to run through the grids. 10-code pulse cut it off. Two of the frequencies that are normally supposed to come in could not come in. The 8th-dimensional frequency and the 12th were cut out. The Breatharians couldn't live on the planet anymore, so they had to be put someplace else than they were. Now, the next one that came in were called the five Urtite cloister races. We lost the word Palladium. So these are just Urtite cloister races. They were seated back here, 208,100 BC. So that it didn't take them too long to get the grids restabilized that time, to put, them, put the races back on. But the Urtite cloister races, they came out of the Palladia races, but there were genetic adjustments made to them. The adjustments were so they could live on a 10-code planet, which means they had to have a biology that was capable of eating because if you can't bring in the Maharata current, you're not going to be able to self-sustain. You're going to need to consume something outside of yourself to sustain enough energy to keep your body alive. So they came in with closer to what we would consider human as far as the insides. The other ones looked like us on the outside, but they were much taller. But on the inside, they were quite different because they didn't have digestive apparatus like we do. They didn't need it. When the Urtite cloisters came in, they did. They had your basic stomach and intestines and like teeth things you need to eat. <laughs> so they were a little bit different than the race that came before them. They were on planet till 75,000 BC when there was another cataclysm. And right around there, there was another glacial period because every time there was a major cataclysm that had anywhere near a stellar activation cycle potential, because stellar activation cycles can happen once every 26,556 years. Actually, the cycle is that long. It can actually happen at four different periods, but only one of those periods within that time period, and only under certain conditions. Every time we got near a potential stellar activation cycle, the place was raided. If we look back in our history, we find, oh, there was a glacial period here, and oh, a glacial period there. 90% of the glacial periods didn't happen by accident. They happened either because we got raided and the grids were crashed, which throws the place into pole spin, and then the weather patterns go crazy because the electromagnetic fields go crazy for a while. Or there are several of them that were intentionally created 
to make mo races move out of certain areas where stargates were. So some of them were intentionally created. Once upon a time, there was something called firmament crystals in the Atlantean period and way before that, even in the Palladia periods. They had a technology that could use selenite crystal rods that they brought in from Cirrus B that are much bigger than the ones that you would find here, selenite crystal. They would erect them in certain ways corresponding to the stargates, and they would create what was called a hydrosuspension field. It was a way of atomizing water and freezing it quickly and suspending it into the atmosphere and making two layers of it with a heat layer in between. And if you regulated the frequencies coming from the selenite rods the right way, you would have climate control. You could have global climate control. If you wanted it to rain, you'd move the heat up in a certain area and it would cre create an interaction. That would create rainfall. Now, of course, if you keep doing that, you're going to deplete your hydro suspension field. So there was a back kick that would draw literally ocean water up, desalinate it, and turn it back into the hydro suspension field. However, it's great to have climate control on the planet. But if somebody doesn't like you and comes in and crashes your crystals, you're going to have big floods, and you're going to have grids going out of whack again. So there were several periods of glacial periods that were created for that because of that. They weren't accidents. They were intentional. Because the fallen angelics knew that, well, if we want that stargate and they're in our way, that's one way to get them out. <laughs> you know? It wasn't always easy to come in and raid directly. Because you had, in Cirrus B, which is one of the closest places to get to from density to, they can get here very quickly compared to some other places because of the way the vortices run. There's a direct vortice that runs from Cirrus B to this planet. It comes down in Kauai, Hawaii. It's called the Halls of Amorea. It was where seeding two was seeded through. It was an extra portal that was put in to connect those two places. So races that raid here have to be very careful not to cross into the Cirrus B uh, area because there will be guardian blockage. They will find themselves in the middle of problems. Excuse me, no, you're not going there. So it's always been like a sneaky infiltration. But anyway, in 7, 000, uh, 75,000 BC, there was another typical. Now, some of the history is going to be revealed in the, in the book that's coming out, in the rewrites for uh, Voyages Volume 2. It shows this bizarre pattern. Talk about history repeating itself over and over and over again. It's the same thing. One of them came in, they messed up what we were trying to do with the grids, they tried to take control of the grids, and somebody got wiped out, and the place rolled. This has happened repeatedly here. Okay, so again, the Urtite cloister races, there are five of them, they went down. Some of them were, most of them were evac They were taken into inner earth, and a lot of them just evolved from there. Now, round three, five cloister races. These guys, if you notice the strand counts, DNA. We started with the 43 to 48, and they progressively got smaller, progressively got smaller. The round two were smaller than the round ones. The round threes are smaller. Here we're getting into, aha, there's a 12-strand pattern. And here are the basic cloister races. They had strand 7 through 12, and they had 1 to, one, uh, to 5, and this one had 1 to 4. They were all missing one. They were taking one out to break them down to create what's called the root races, which were the round four cycle. If you also notice, down here, we're going, you have these guys, the Earth, uh, Palladia races, some of them incarnated with modified form with these. So you had round one and two combining. Then you had rounds one, two, and three combining here. So you had little bits of the other two coming in with these. By the time you got to round four, you had rounds one, two, three, and four along with the root races. So right now, in our race cycle, that really started in 71,000 BC, that's when the root races started to be put here. We have, literally, all of those. We fit in to one of those. One of those is our family line. Over here, we have the blue flame races. In this middle one, we have the blue gold. In the total center one, we have the gold, and we have the gold violet and the violet. This can tell you some interesting things about the way the evolutionary blueprint was structured. There is an eloquent design to this, and you're part of that design. Your DNA template has a place within this. Now, we can move to, can we move to the next one? Thank you. Now we're going to get into the sacred mission. It has to do with that design, with the fact that you're part of that four rounds, those four 
different rounds of the evolutionary cycles of the rounds. Angelic humanity's original sacred mission. We were supposed to correct the fire letter sequences in Earth's planetary shields. This, I mentioned before, was called the Christos Realignment Mission. It wasn't supposed to be hard. It wouldn't be hard if we hadn't been zapped and we don't remember who we are or how to do it. It sounds like most people, if you tried to tell this to people on the street, they'd be like, huh, DNA, what's that? You know, some of them know what DNA is, but what do you mean DNA in planetary grids? We've lost touch with our connection to the earth that was always there. That was done on purpose because we have a purpose here. We're in a stellar activation cycle now. There are probabilities that are not the line of ones we came out of in the future. Because if, as I was describing, in those other rounds, they met with a destiny that was not positive. They got invaded and the grids crashed. This is going to be our karmic bleed through again, as it was in round two from round one, in round three from round two, we have a chance to link with a whole different probability vector, which means there is a different set of time cycles and lines that are interwoven with this, but where it went right, where each one of those races didn't get flattened, where they did get their part of the Christos realignment mission done. We can end up as one of the ones that don't get it done, or we can shift our time continuum into an area where it was done, link our frequencies with theirs, they'll pull us up and out of it. This is what will stop a repeat of the history. They were hoping, the Guardian Alliance and the Founders Races, the Brenau, were hoping that as we moved into this stellar activation cycle, they were negotiating for literally thousands of years with the Anunnaki races who hold a huge amount of the grids here, not because they were given to them either, because they took them. They were negotiating with them. Say, look, you have some of your races on the planet, we have ours. Why don't we do this peaceful? You know, you, you, if you let it roll, your guys are going to be killed too. They don't care. They'll just back another settlement committee out. They agreed that they would assist. And they pulled out at the last minute. That's why all of a sudden, all this information is being given. In September, on September 12th of 2000, they broke the final agreement and they joined with the Drax, with the Draconian races, in a united resistance that issued an edict of war to the Guardian races. They said, it's war unless you pull out now. Take 50,000 of your indigo children out, we'll let you do that, then leave the rest of them, leave them alone. It wasn't a very good bargain. And you don't intimidate Guardians that way. They said no. And they said, fine, then we're at war. Now, war there doesn't mean we're going to come in with big cannons, not unless they get really desperate. What it means is they're going to play games behind the scenes. That's what's happening here. Right now, we're in a position that since 25,500 BC, the Nibiru and Anunnaki from density two, actually Nibiru dips into density one cycles and then cycles back out through its orbit out by Sears, Sears Bay and it goes into density two. So it's a, a planet that actually shifts in frequency from density one to density two. When they come into density one, that's when they terrorize us. They also have what's called a battle star that they like to also call their planet. So we never know when it's coming or when it's going. The battle star is put in the opposite orbit. So when the planet goes out on its 3,600 and some year orbit, the battle star comes in because they've been monitoring us for thousands of years. They got control of Stargate four which is the solar stargate that connects to Giza, that connects to Giza, Egypt here, connects to the Great Pyramid, which used to be a teleport station before that was knocked out of alignment. As long as Nibiru is controlling the alignment of Earth's planetary magnetic fields, they will not be able to align the right way with the solar magnetic fields to be able to handle that universal life force current. Just like we talked about last night, we talked about having the uh, Kirishe, the Maharada, and the Antankarana running through you. Well, the planet has it running through it too. Right now, instead of a vertical line, you have a vertical line coming down until you hit D4. Then it shifts over to Nibiru instead of being a straight line. And then it reverses, because Nibiru spins in a reverse orbit, because they reverse the fire letter sequences in their planetary grids. That's what they're trying to do here. There's only one thing that can stop them from doing it, because they've made a lot of advancement. Humans, angelic humans, 
who remember that they have the DNA templates that go with the planetary grids that run the sequences in the right way. Humans who have the ability to hold D12 frequency, when Anunnaki can only hold 11 dimensions of frequency. Right now, we're being asked to fulfill our sacred mission because the angelic races and the fallen angelic races who have been at this for thousands of years are coming in for the final conflict. They have made so much progress, the fallen angelics, particularly the Anunnaki. Everybody thinks the Drax are the bad guys. Well, they're not the great guys, for sure. But they have D10 consciousness. The Anunnaki races, the fallen angelic Anunnaki races, have D11 consciousness. It's a whole notch above. They're smarter. They're trickier. They're, they almost gloat sometimes. There's an arrogance that comes with that race that you can see sometimes bleeding through humans that have part Anunnaki gene codes because they've hybridized here. An arrogance level that comes through with race supremacy in a real just, I am better than you because I am, you know, this kind of stuff. This is such an Anunnaki vibe, such a distortion of their gene code. When you're dealing with draconians, it's kind of like dealing with sharks. A shark sees food, it's going to eat it. You're not going to sit there and reason with it. You're not going to change its mind. But it's just like a basic instinct driven, not a lot of thought process on it. Anunnaki are shifty. They're the ones that will come in and say, we're your space brothers. We created you. Aren't you so glad? Why don't you follow us now? You know, do it. They're trying to talk to the channels right now. They're talking to our channels. Just like they did in the biblical period when they tried to hijack the Christ mission. Just like they did in Atlantis when they tried to hijack. And they did a very good job at hijacking what the Grail Line races were trying to do to protect the Atlantean territories from their invasion. If you check out the internet, it's scary. <laughs> Do you know how many people are talking to space people and all sorts of gods of ancient times? Everybody's talking these days through channels. Unfortunately, channels don't realize they have a 15-dimensional structure, and if they don't seal it to D12, anything can come in and call itself anything from D11 on down. They're being tricked. This is what they've done before. They don't come in. You have to be really not real intelligent if you just come in and raid something and say, we're going to take over your planet. No, no, you make friends with them. You know, we're your buddies. Here, we're helping you. Yeah, we'll give you some ascension mechanics, except we'll leave out the details about D12. You know, these kind of things. There, it's really scary what's going on here because you have mainstream population saying, oh, you know, New Ages are airheads, so don't listen to them. They don't know anything. Then you have the UFO people over here. They're saying, uh, New Agers are airheads. You don't, have, you don't listen to them, but we see aliens. We see little grays running around. The New Agers point at them saying, oh, you're just fear-based consciousness. Nobody's listening to anybody. They're not putting the pieces together and realizing, yo, something's talking to people here. Something's flying in ships in the skies. Maybe we're being visited, and maybe they're not friendly. <coughs> this is what's going on. There's not time left to try to take 25 years to convince the politicians or to convince the people in government that, you know, there might be a problem here. Part of them already know there's a problem here because they created it. Because in the 1930s, they signed uh, treaties with the Zeta races, which are a draconian-backed race. Then they got in over their heads because the Drax decided to come in themselves. They didn't just send their little gray reps anymore. When they realized stellar activation was going down, when it was confirmed, that's when the big leagues came in. That's when our governments are... Not, I'm not saying the outer government, because the outer government doesn't know anything about this stuff. They hear the rumors and they think, how could that possibly be? Our government's good. You know? It's the interior world government that has pieces in every country. You know who they are? They're called the Leviathan races. They look like humans. But if you trace their gene codes back, you'll find a little Cro-Magnon there. You'll find a little Neanderthal in there, too. Because they're part Anunnaki. And from the Anunnaki, the Draconians raided. Anunnaki couldn't originally interbreed with us because their templates were not compatible. They could hybridize, but most of the babies would die or they'd be mutated some way. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you what happened and how they were, they were able to infiltrate our race lines here and what they've done with it. But for now, I just want you to realize we're not alone, not just out there. We're not alone here, but we can make a difference. It's not about making enemies. It's about realizing 
when there are races that are creating damage to other races, they're also creating damage to themselves. They're like children who got messed up. And you need to love them. Somebody's got to. However, you also need to stop them from causing harm. Not going after them and killing them, but making it so they can't do the harm. We can do something here by learning to run the Stargate codes. There's something called, and this was what the Arthur legends, the King Arthur legends were all about, but they actually came out of Atlantis, and they actually came out of the Palladia races, 790,000 BC. They were called the round tables, the rainbow round tables. The evol evolutionary blueprint, where we were supposed to, those four interwoven time cycles of human evolution, each part was supposed to anchor a part of the frequencies of the D12 Christos template for the planet. That D12 Christos template for the planet, its fourth density level, was called Aromatena. That was the name of Stargate 12. That was what the Earth Terra Gaia system was aligned with. The planet Aromatena is no longer there. It was a liquid light planet, and it was destroyed in uh, 250 billion years ago when the Anu Elohim blew it up because we wouldn't destroy the Drax for them. Very old battle. That was before humans, as humans, were here. But what we're supposed to do in those four evolutionary rounds, including ours, is to anchor the frequencies of a quarter of that pattern. It isn't that hard. It's just remembering who we are. Remembering that, wow, our DNA does connect to the planetary grids, doesn't it? This is where we get into understanding enough technique where you can activate what's yours to activate. And when you do, it's not just helping the planet, it's helping you too. Because it's getting back what you've been searching for all along here. Once you get your Christo self back and you can walk around with 12 dimensions of consciousness, this is our potential, minimum of our potential. And once you do that, even if you're not an indigo child, you can go through genetic adjustments to expand that pattern. <coughs> if we learn to run our DNA template consciously, that sounds impossible. I mean, you know, scientists would laugh at you, laugh you right out the door. Yeah, right. You know, they're still trying to figure out what's in a DNA template. They don't even know we have a DNA template. They know we have DNA. There's a difference. DNA is the stuff that manifests on top of the template. You can play with that all you want, but you're not going to the causal level. Dealing with the DNA template was supposed to be a conscious process. The Palladia races, the Urtite cloister races, and the regular cloister races all knew how to shut their DNA on and off. They could regulate the amount of primal life force current that would come through their bodies. They would be able to regulate when they would turn the D12 current on and when they would shut it off so they didn't overwhelm the grids. If they needed more frequency for healing, they would turn certain codes on and let it come through. If they wanted to go through a stargate, they'd turn them all up and they'd demanifest here and pop up through the stargate up in the next density level. They had full conscious control of this. And the they that I'm talking about are the other yous, the other me's, the other us's. We have incarnations here. And we'll get into a little bit of that pattern of incarnations. Each one of us, if you happen to be a human with a 12-strand DNA template, has 1,728 incarnations in your four cycle. In those four rounds, there are literally 1,728 of you. These are your Christos family. If you put them all back together, that would be you as a Christed avatar. The process of activating DNA begins to open stargates inside the body. The DNA template works like stargates. They're internal stargates that open up the frequencies between those different time vectors where you can start to pull in your consciousness from the other places where that self and this one start to realize, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a big self, I'm an eternal self that's manifesting in several different places now for several different reasons totally shifts how you view yourself. I know the shift and I can describe it because I moved through it. And it's fascinating to look back on how you used to look at things. You don't quite catch it while it's happening. It's like your DNA activates, you get caught up in stuff, you're doing your own things. And after a while you realize you just know yourself in a new way. I know myself and, and I have full conscious memory of a good, I don't have full conscious memory of all 1728 yet. I can't hold it all in the body yet. But I have a good maybe 200 of them with very clear memory and I can connect with them. I can't always get the whole sequence. This is how it starts when your strands activate. This is what it means to open the windows. 
you get to the point where you can look out the eyes of some of the others and realize, oh, that's me too, there. It's like all of a sudden you realize you're an eternal actor on an eternal stage and you're wearing this costume and this personality here and this one here. You start to realize, first of all, you'll find that you come in every shape and size. <laughs> you're male, you're female, you're black, you're white, you're Caucasian, you're speckled. I mean, there's all sorts of things you're going to find that will really dissolve any prejudices you have. Because if you're prejudiced against something, it probably has something to do with the fact that you have one and you're having a problem with it. There's something coming up from it that's bothering you, so you're re projecting it outside on somebody else. If we could realize we're part of this mission, we're not only part of it. At this point, for this time vector, we have the ability to run the Stargate codes. It will help us, but it'll help to get the frequency into the planet that will allow us to make a time continuum shift. The time continuum shift is called the Bridge Zone Project. We have until June of 2002 to get it to a certain place of frequency. If it doesn't get there by then, the Guardians are going to have to go to Plan B, which is EVAC. And they'll get anybody out into inner Earth that they can, that has the DNA template activation that can sustain that. And as long as you're nice, because we're not going to let a bunch of you know, invaders in <laughs> that are going to take over inner Earth. But I'm sure most of you are nice. So anyway, we're in the middle of an immense drama it's like better than sci-fi channel. It really is. <laughs> yeah. The scary part is that it isn't sci-fi channel, which is kind of like, if I, I found when they were giving me this data, and like, I've seen a lot, so it's really hard to do anything to me. It's like, oh, all right, whatever. I remember a lot. I remember getting flattened in different lifetimes for different reasons. So it's hard to like, you know, shake me up or anything. I didn't get sh shaken up. I just went into this like blank space this kind of like non-reaction at all? Oh, we might have to talk about pole shift, huh? Oh, I remember one of those. I was there with the fall of Brenaway. There will be a, a delay factor. You'll, you'll think about the things you heard here and go, wow, yeah, some of that feels right. Pole shift? You know, pole shift seems like such an unbelievable thing. It couldn't happen to us, especially in America. Nothing happens to America, right? We've been safe, you know, when there's wars and stuff, they're over there someplace, you know? We're raised to think that nothing's going to happen to us ever, which makes us just a little vulnerable. In case it does, we're going to be devastated. Oh my God, it can happen to us, you know? It's not about being afraid. It's about being effective. There are literally, because... People who run the Maharata current, who learn how to turn on the DNA, you can take 12 of them, and you probably need, let me get a number, how many? Okay, we <laughs> just got some commentary. About 78,000 people that don't have it turned on. <laughs> that wasn't my number, I got <laughs> get a little bit of, uh, somebody threw that down at me. Let's say you have 78,000 people that don't have the higher codes in the DNA turned on, and you have a dozen who do the dozen has more power to shift the grids than the 78,000. It won't take that many. That's why every person counts. That's why it's not we're saying, oh my God, it's such a big problem, we can't do anything about it. Look at all of the ones that are sleepers. Look at all the ones that don't care. Look at all the ones that are Illuminati, you know, that really wanted to go into bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It can be overwhelming if you look at it that way. But if you realize the power you have in starting to reclaim what's yours and what lives right within you, it's not a scary thing. There's basically two scenarios. Either it will pull shift or it won't. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a scenario that manifests in the next 10 years. In the next 10 years. I, mean, I listen to my daughter. She's in college now. And she's talking about, you know, she's going to college and she wants to get into media and, you know, she wants to grow up and be a TV personality. And saying, yeah, I hope they have TV by then. You know? <laughs> yeah. it's, a very, it's very hard to plan on exactly what you're going to do in 10 years if you don't know which way it's going to go. Because if you found out it was really going to go, then it's like, where's my credit card? <laughs> Might as well enjoy it while I can. You know, I don't have one, so I wouldn't do that. But... You'd have a whole different orientation if you knew one way or the other. If somebody said, oh, well, there's no way to stop it. It's going to be pole shift. Here's what you can do if you don't want to die on the planet. There's an evac plan. Okay, let's do evac. That would be the natural survival instinct. 
But we're in a situation that is unnerving because we don't know which way it's going to go. And what's going to determine which way it's going to go is human participation. It will depend on how many rainbow round tables, how many signet councils, a signet is a stargate, how many groups of people we can get together, train them how to activate in their DNA the tribal shield. And once that's activated, how to run the codes into the planetary grids, into the right stargates. What we're going to do today, before this is over, we're going to activate the tribal shields. And you know, they've been telling me about this. You're going to activate the tribal shields. Well, will you tell me how to activate the tribal shield? Because you haven't told me yet either. I've been talking to them about it, but, you know, for like weeks on this. They told me we were going to teach tribal shield activation. And I was like, well, great. I'll be able to do that. When you teach me what you're talking about? Well, they told me last night. <laughs>